Simpsons Index, an online spreadsheet that is also a podcast. This is the podcast. Coming to you out of SideQuest Studios, this is the Simpsons Index, the ninth Treehouse of Horrorthon. Ooh. Ooh. Spooky noises. <laughs> I'm your host, Elliot J. O'Neill, and joining me from Side Hustle Studios is BT Callaway. Uh, hoy, hoy. And joining us all the way from Washington State in the United States is Steve Guntley. Hello. Hi. How's it going? And Woody Siskowski. Hi. The only invisible killer that I believe in is God. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for joining us for The Simpsons Index. This is a podcast where we watch and review three episodes of The Simpsons at a time, but there is a twist. Each episode must come from a different decade. And on this spooky podcast, we're doing all Treehouse of Horror episodes. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I forgot to mention. Yes, yeah, Steve and Woody from Ultra 64, now We Universe. Mm-hmm. I mean, they've been here so many times. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> we, we pop in. In. We pop in from time to time. Mm. Yeah, who are now doing the spooky task of reviewing every <laughs> Wii U game. My, it's yeah. been terrifying. It's much spookier than the N64, <laughs> we will say that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, just wanted to throw it to you guys. Uh, what is your history with the Treehouse of Horror episodes? I mean, I, I always really look forward to the Treehouse of Horror episodes. I like any show when they can kind of like break away from canon and just sort of let mm. the characters have fun. Mm. I think as the Treehouse episodes have gone on, it's just like finding new and difficult ways to kill members of the Simpsons family, <laughs> which, yep. you know, has has various hits and misses. But uh, it, mm. I, it's always still fun when they break continuity and just kind of let the characters do whatever. I feel like the uh, Treehouse 4 episodes have really become like a focal point, like they use them to launch. I think each new season at this point launches with a Treehouse of Horror. Yeah, like as pretty much. The, the first or second episode. And I have never been like a huge fan of them, but I feel like that's more that I'm not necessarily like a big horror buff. Mm. And more and more, they I think they've become reliant on just parody as like, yeah. oh, absolutely. It, it's all just a total knockoff of something else, which is fine. But kind of the initial Treehouse of Horrors used to just be like, the Simpsons encounter some zombies. Yeah. Or Homer's the last person on lot. Like, it's definitely a parody of well-worn horror tropes, but it's mm-hmm. not as often a direct parody of something the way it sort of is here. Well, I, I, I feel like it's gone from, like, pretty much strictly Twilight Zone uh, uh, riffs mm. to <laughs> yeah. movie parody, or to horror movie parodies, and now they're, like, beyond horror movie, and it's just any kind of genre. Yeah, like, yeah. Any movie where someone dies is now open game. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So yeah. But it's much. just become iconography like anything that you can still identify the source with the Simpsons in the outfit. Mm, yeah. Like that that that's it. Like it doesn't matter who's the character. It's just like how how can we fit people in to these different roles? Yeah. yeah. Like Mr. Yeah. Burns I, as a Morton Joe is not like always a go-to, <laughs> but it's just like, well, he would be the natural yeah. counterpart mm-hmm. there. Yeah, well, we always use the shinning as like the classic reference of Simpsons doing a parody of something, but you as the audience, you don't have to have ever have seen it. Like, to sure. be honest, I still I still haven't seen The Shining. And- huh. Well, they're they're kind of like three or four minute like recaps of what they are. Increasingly, it's just mm. like they're going to give you the whole story of what they're parodying, whether yeah. it may, as in the case of the episode we just watched, whether it makes sense or not. Yeah, <laughs> and I don't think it did. <laughs> so no. I like that we don't need to reference which segment you mean doesn't make sense. All of <laughs> yeah, them have that it, problem. It, it's it's consistent throughout. Yeah. Yep. Well, this is this is something that I've noticed even on the because I was watching some of the more recent episodes, um, embarrassingly on my own free time <laughs> when I just needed to really have my brain not function. And all That's of the, embarrassing? <laughs> yeah, a little bit. Uh, <laughs> all of these episodes of the later season function at such a incredibly high speed. Like yeah. it's like the way that they jump from the couch gag to the episode starting, and they it's seemingly every episode has to make some reference to the number of episodes that they have done. Yeah. This one is mm. six hundred, which I get is kind of a meaningful milestone, but at some mm-hmm. point once you've had 600, every additional 100 feels kind of irrelevant. Like, you're like, yeah, yeah so what? You're at 700. <laughs> yeah, great. you knocked off another 100. Congrats. Yeah, and like, Al Jean mm. has a real hard on for like having more episodes than Gunsmoke. Oh. He's an old, old man. And that was, uh, <laughs> that was part of his scary name in this episode, too, is Al, we're coming for you, Gunsmoke Gene. Which, I, y- I don't know. Yeah. It's, when you factor in the fact that this episode is just totally based on parody and reference, and then you also have it so based on knowing the history of the show like 
I don't necessarily, I'm not crazy about this episode as someone who has seen tons of episodes of The Simpsons, but if you were someone who had seen very few episodes of The Simpsons, this would just be total chaos. Yeah. Like, yeah. Oh, yeah. it would not make sense. <laughs> yeah, there was a bit in, like, maybe the second one where there's a, an establishing shot to the next scene and then the interior, and it happens so quickly, there's almost like a pop in the audio of them just, you know, <laughs> outside of house, inside, and like, okay, wow, yeah. shit, and it's just... It's yeah. very, it's, I mean, I noticed it. We'll put it that way. All right. Well, let's hook into the episode review. We just watched season 28, episode four, Treehouse of Horror, XXVII. That's 27. First <laughs> released in October of 2016. It was directed by Stephen Dean Moore, written by Joel H. Cohen. And yeah, as Woody mentioned, this is the 600th episode of The Simpsons. Because the Treehouse of Horrors, you know, work fundamentally different to a Simpsons mm-hmm. episode, the questionnaire essentially gets thrown out in this one. So we just sort of do, you know, brief uh, review of each segment so yeah starting out the whole Halloween night and the Simpsons are confronted by Sideshow Bob the ghost of Grimes and one of the aliens I mean couch gag part one of two yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly. I mean, I guess this kind of carries on the tradition that they used to have where like Marge would come up in front of a stage and be like, parents, mm. the episode you're about to see is very scary. That sort of served a purpose originally because it people were not accustomed to the idea of this is a horror anthology, not mm. in canon. Right. But like here, I don't know why they have this intro at all. And based on how rushed everything later in the episode yep. felt, I'm like, if this segment, what this segment was maybe a minute long, mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. they could have really used that minute um, to actually like pad oh, things yeah. out a little bit. Yeah, and it's not like Let anything. Anything breathe. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, they have like a full, there's a foursome of sideshow Bob, the ghost of Frank Grimes, Kang, Kang and or Kodos, and yeah. then and oh, then and leprechaun. The leprechaun. What is the deal with this leprechaun? The- what is the deal with this leprechaun? <laughs> <laughs> like, it's I I know that leprechaun was from a past treehouse yeah. episode. Was that leprechaun that Ralph saw in his sandbox? Oh yeah, yeah. Things? It started out as Ralph's imaginary uh, friend enemy. I don't know, and then appeared in the treehouse of horror where it married a. A gypsy lady or something you are remembering that accurately <laughs> yeah yeah and like pierce brosnan was in that episode i think and like mm-hmm. he gets kidnapped <laughs> by him in the end it's it's weird but like has that become like a beloved character in the interim is that is that like the the new cat lady or something he, like he does pop up every now and then yeah well, really we, we were supposed to be excited to see that leprechaun show up i was just like Okay, so now they're going to do a river dance parody, which is firstly 20 years too late for that. Because well, they play it like a reveal. They're, he's yeah. like yeah. Our, yeah. our evil foursome, and they're like, oh, Get who's the ready fourth for person? This. And you're like, oh, it's this leprechaun that has very little history and apparently has it out for the Simpsons, even yeah. though I don't know if they've ever interacted. Like, Well, even Sideshow Bob like has a line something like, yes, we're all people that have lost to Homer Simpson, and it's like, no, your thing was more Bart, but yeah, Sideshow Bob yeah. has nothing against Homer. He, yeah, he drove yeah. through the neighborhood in one episode. Yep. The following Simpsons residents will not be killed by me. <laughs> and also, like Kang and Kodos are generally just like observers; like they're not nemeses to Homer. And the few times they've run up against Homer, they've won. Yeah, like he, yeah. they've they've been enslaved when they became president. Like yeah, so it just it, these are random picks. Also, they didn't use a Kang or Kodos voice; it was just like a. Yeah alien screech so is it just like a third character i don't know yeah uh kudos yeah (laughs) kudos yeah kang kudos and kudos yeah so this was dumb and pointless and yeah maggie just just killed so much time Oh, and yeah. Maggie is, Maggie's Halloween costume is a droog, mm-hmm. which, why? Mm. What, Beloved children's character, the droog, yeah. as seen in Space Jam and yeah. Legacy. What is, why do people keep, like, bringing the droog? I, mm. I, don't, I don't know. I'm, I don't like the, the movie of Clockwork Orange very much, but it's weird that the droogs have, like, I guess I hate it when things develop to the place of just being an icon that people yeah. recognize and, and totally remove what they from their context. Are. Right. Yeah, exactly. Because, yeah. like, the droogs serve a place in that movie. <laughs> They're like, fucked up, though. Yeah. Like, they, it, that's the, yeah. People aren't, these are not beloved kids' characters. Yeah. There, you, yeah. It yeah, was you, weird enough when Bart did it in season four or whatever that one was. Yeah. Yeah, but at least that's it was right. just a costume reference. And yeah. if you got it, that was fine. That uh, that early Ivanka twenty twenty eight joke made me cringe, especially hearing yeah. like the re- the release date of this was it was before Trump was actually elected. You know, so a like, month before, if I'm correct, yeah, yeah, people people thought that was still not going to happen. That is st- such an upsetting mentality and time to go back to, because um, mm. it was so long that he was just a joke, and it kept yep. pursuing of like this is going to be a joke and it's fun to laugh at, and then at 
And then it, it is not four, fun to laugh four at Four weeks anymore. after nah. this, it was not fun. Mm, yeah. <laughs> it was not fun at all. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so on that depressing note, we move on to Couch Gag Part 2 of 2. <laughs> yeah, Planet of the Couches. Yeah, I, I've got no real notes. <laughs> I, just wrote, I just wrote down, oh wait, this is the Couch Gag? What? Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I do... I'm I'm in favor of like the couch gags getting more and more elaborate as the show goes on and like they're bringing in guest directors and guest animators and stuff like this but again with the we're doing a Planet of the Apes parody in 2016 like yeah original Planet of the Apes mm-hmm. not like the new like Andy Circus flavor and it, it it's just we've been to the Planet of the Apes well so many times on the Simpsons yeah. at this point. I mean, you know, I hate every ape I see from chimpanzee to chimpanzee. <laughs> That's right. They already they they perfected it. They why, did it. Why, they why nailed it. Yeah, Doctor Zayas, Doctor Zayas. Yeah. I guess what I appreciated about it was the fact I did I thought initially because it does come out of nowhere that it was the first segment. Yeah, and mm. you essentially get what the segment is in the first three seconds of it. <laughs> it was mm-hmm. like Planet of the Couches, and then they cut to this you know, the planet with all the different couches fulfilling the same role that the apes did. And you're like, well, they can't really do anything else with this. Like yeah. the joke is basically explained <laughs> yeah. instantly. And so at least the fact that it was, you know, a 40 second couch gag instead of an actual segment, I appreciate it. Yeah. Even though it wasn't very funny. Like what's the joke is that Lar Land Donuts is there instead of the Statue of Liberty. Yeah. They don't even mm-hmm. react to that. There's no like you blew it up or <laughs> anything like that. Like, yeah, I think that was my problem with it being a silent segment, even though it is just a couch gag. Cause yeah, you don't get any of those sort of references and you're mm-hmm. left with the visual ones, which are like fine. And clever in a way but also yeah it's just, it just you feel the time being taken up yeah there was yeah there was yeah. a real f- recurring feeling of here of things just not having jokes like there's just mm. an idea which is not an intrinsically bad idea of like planet mm-hmm. of the couches but like once you do that you still have to write a joke you yeah still have to something yeah. funny has to occur instead of just instead of apes you just swap couches yeah it's a, it's all very <laughs> first draft oh yeah no, definitely yeah, it's like that, uh, you know, bratty little kid that wants both things. You're like, now, 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 Simpsons, you get one couch gag. <laughs> and you have to share it. It is the kid just mashing all their uh, cross-franchise toys together, though, isn't it? <laughs> you got the alien and Sideshow Bob and Grimes, and they're mad at Homer, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and then there's couches, and there's a planet of them, and all the couches chase Homer, and it's like, okay, shut up, one. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so on to our first segment, Dry Hard. Now, this is initially a parody of The Hunger Games, but moves into Fury Road. Hey, y'all, what did you think? Boring. Uh, <laughs> wow, what a terrible skit. Yeah, what a, a whole a, a really bad, bad segment. with no, Again, with the, just like, I, I think my comment after that segment finished was like, I think they forgot to write this. Like, it, it's just not even, it, it's not even they forgot to put jokes in it. It's like, I think they, they seemed to forget midway through what they were doing and then started doing something else. And it's like, Mm. The the one thing I thought was a little funny was like Burns just being really flagrant, wasting the water, you know, like because that's that's at least something approaching a commentary, you know, it's like, oh, this guy's yeah. controlling all the water and he's just being like, well, that was always that was always a weird aspect of uh, Fury Road was yeah. that when they, they finally get the water or like and Morton Joe lets the masses have the water, he just like unleashes this giant gusher of water and mm-hmm. has everyone like run up to it and you're like you know i think a lot of water is getting lost here like yeah you could yeah. parcel it out <laughs> yeah <laughs> at least he wasn't doing a flash dance parody <laughs> yeah he conserved that amount of water at least God. that's true and i i did i the gag here that i liked was the kids sort of in the hunger games exploding and then them playing taps and sort of the image getting raised. I thought that was funny. Mm. I did not understand the visual joke at all of the unibrow baby shooting a shotgun and then Mm. only her unibrow being left. Yeah, like, I, there, there seemed to be frames missing or something. That was the thing. I genuinely didn't understand what I was looking at because it didn't really look like the unibrow and it looked like something that was stuck to the yeah. outer bubble in the distance or something. So I, I just didn't know what I was looking but at. But what happened to the baby herself? Because she just shot a shotgun like into the air and then vaporized or is something. It, is like. it supposed to be like a like a Daffy Duck thing, like where you just like get blasted backwards and then you just leave your duck bill behind? Did yeah, but then we never saw the body. But I don't it, know. It just I want to see visual. the baby's body. <laughs> There's yeah. not enough dead kids. Yeah. There's not enough child murder there in this episode. There was a lot of child murder in this episode. Yeah. yeah. 
But uh, have you guys seen the Hunger Games? I still haven't. And yeah. I never finished the series, weirdly. Like, I watched the first three and then stopped. Oh, yeah. And there's no, only first, four. <laughs> I watched the first movie and then the second one, and then I realized, oh, the second one is bullshit, and I quit. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> first one's still pretty good, I think. I don't know. I think it's solid. Hmm. Because, yeah, we do like to ask on the Treehouse of Horror, how were the parody elements of this? Did this remind you of The Hunger Games and have some just, good in-jokes for you? Just wildly unfocused. We've already mentioned it. Like, there's an idea to be mined there. We spend so little time actually in it that nothing really matters. And he's like, oh, I, and now we're doing uh, Fury Road, and there's a dash of twisted metal thrown in there. And it's like, <laughs> okay, fuck, fine, whatever. And a sprinkle of flash dance. Yeah, it, well, it, it, I mean, we just we just kind of like hard cut to Lisa being in the games. Like, we don't get to see like a selection pro. Like, you know, part of the iconography of Hunger Games is the whole "I volunteer" sequence and the mm. fact that like there's this culling of like, children in the neighborhood. You know, that's that's kind of the heart of your parody. And so they kind of just toss them in there. Skinner's like kind of dressed like a Thundercat or something for some reason, which doesn't yeah. like. Like, the styles in Hunger Games are ostentatious and big like that, but that's not, like, a specific visual clue that I recognized. Yeah, when I saw him, I was like, why does he look like... I guess he's meant to be, yeah, the overdone, ostentatious fashion of the movie, but it was just yeah. it was confusing. Like, it didn't mm. fit. And even the time that felt like they had something to play off of where Lisa meets Peta and then meets Peta again, yeah. the two different mm. Petas, and they immediately are killed off as as the joke of Homer's character coming in. And then I again I, I laughed when it said what did it what did it label as I'm like Two Sunken Dream Boats. Two Sunken Dream Boats, yeah. yeah. I thought that was a good gag. But again, it was so much they didn't wanna commit to having any jokes in the parody. They're just like, Well, we have to have a, a love interest for Lisa, but we don't want to actually explore that as a plot mm. point. We just have it in there so we can have a joke of Homer stomping on them, which is not even really a joke. It also feels like they didn't really watch the Hunger Games, or maybe they forgot the name of the other character, yeah. like in that love triangle, like which I'm now also forgetting. But <laughs> well, they also made this joke in the Lego episode where Lisa w goes and watches the Hunger Games, and their point is, "Oh my God, how am I going to decide between these two exactly attractive men?" Um, woe is me. It felt like they were just doing the same thing here, to be honest. But yeah, on the casting of the episode, you know, we were talking before how the Simpsons like to have fun with this. Of course, Lisa as Katniss makes sense, but yeah, I did like Homer's casting as whatever the Woody Harrelson character was. Hamish, and I think. Hamish, yeah, they call him Homish here. Yeah, and he, I didn't hate the visual joke of him drinking Logan's rum. Yeah. I, I liked it that they brought it back, too. Like, like the Logan's rum stuck around to the later joke. Like, that made it a little funnier, but... But yeah, it's funny in the, you know, no snorty sense. Just one of them. Just to, yeah, just to, yeah. I'm and pretty he, sure the noise gate is going to get rid of that anyway. And Sorry. then his his function is just to show up and kind of comment on the trope. He's like, "Oh, I'm the one who yeah. like is in all of these movies, and I'll become easily sober because that's what all alcoholics do." I'm just like, "Okay, all right, we get it." Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. I did yeah. think that the elements of parody for the Mad Max were, even though they were even briefer. In yeah, there, like sort of all you get that parodies Mad Max is Mr. Burns wasting the water. And then the pan across where they're in all these different vehicles. I did think that they sort of stretched the creative muscles a little bit. Like Hans Moleman was in some kind of like weird robot machine that mm. was like powered by his head. Yeah. And like the, the designs Hans there. Were, yeah. That's the, yeah. The designs there felt like they put effort in. And it's probably because I'm guessing that the writers and animators were much more interested in Mad Max than they were the Hunger Games. Like, yeah. Fury Road is still relatively fresh even mm -hmm. now as, like, a mining of parody. Like, when you saw it in Space Jam, you're like, oh, it's fun to see this again. It yeah. has not necessarily been done to death the way, like, a Matrix parody has. Right. And in I the think, new Space Jam, there's a Mad Max parody? Oh, oh yes. boy, is there ever. It's, yeah. Oh, fuck it. <laughs> and a Matrix parody. <laughs> Have you yeah. seen it too, Beach? No. Oh. <laughs> I just know things sometimes and I don't quite know how. <laughs> yeah, where, whereas, like, the Matrix parody and stuff in it does feel like a very reach and very sad. Like, the Mad Max parody is, you're like, well, I, I like Mad Max. It's sure. fun to see this again. Not that yeah. I don't like the Matrix, but... And, and this, is, this is very much in the same sense. It was just like, well, this is still cool iconography, even if it's done as a parody. It's still cool to see all these bizarre vehicles with flames going down the desert. 
Yeah. yeah, but also like it feels like they watched the trailer to Fury Road and saw <laughs> like the people on the stilts and everything because mm. you know people being in mech suits and everything like that isn't part of the Fury Road aesthetic at all. It's just kind of like oh, okay, let's just throw a couple more futury looking things in here. So how about the ending as well with the rapid uh, part two, part three, part four uh, ending? What do you guys think of that? It got crazy. I thought I was going to go for, because the, you know, Hunger Games third movie famously got split into two, because that's what they do with franchises now. So I thought it was going to be like part three, part one, part three, part two. Yeah. And then they didn't do that. And it's like, that was the only joke that you could mine from having these different parts, other than the sudden skips forward in time. And you didn't do it. Yeah, I mean, it, it was just such a rush to wrap it up, because it was just like... Uh, cut to three. Oh, we're all drowning. Cut to four. Oh, we're all like frozen. And then Ralph's head shows up and he says, I'm a god in this reality. And she says, okay, yep. whatever. And then the scene ends. It was very yeah. like hand wavy, like literally in the text and just subtextually. It's just like, yeah, we don't care about this. We just need yeah. to end it. That felt like they were just recording the writer's room, you know. Eh, sure, whatever. whatever. It's over. It's 3 a.m. Yeah. I don't care. Yeah, yeah that whole <laughs> section was just, to me, is one of the most chaotic and just, like, baffling sequences that I've ever seen on The Simpsons yeah. in terms of, like, the speed that it just instantly cut from one thing to the next and sort of... Usually, like, I'm a proponent of, like, the mentality that, like, make your jokes fast. Like, just cut from one joke to the next and one of them will stick. But, like, this came... Not that the jokes were great, but, like, this came so fast that I was just total. And I watched this episode maybe, like, two, three months ago. Mm. One thing I've noticed mm. about newer Simpsons is none of them stick in your mind. Oh, like, not at all. On like Disney Plus, I was like, wow, I've watched all of season 28 and the only one I remember was the one where they go to Boston. Which is like, like a <laughs> real indictment too for like people like the four of us who speak fluent Simpsons, you know, up mm. to a certain yeah. point. Like we can pull any Simpsons quote out of our ass. But then, yeah, so the, the fact that none of them stick anymore is is uh, an indictment. Yeah, and just, like, the, the incredible speed where they, like, the first time where they go, part one, part two, I laughed. But then the way it totally ratchets up and just gets so crazy, I'm like, I don't, this is, this is just a barrage of images coming at me with no sort of context. Yeah. Yeah, and when organizing guests for this show, sometimes they ask, oh, can I watch the episodes ahead and then we record the podcast? I'm like, no, we need to, like, record immediately yeah. after watching a special The fresh ISD. reaction. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the thing that I always think is weird about this is like the common criticism I feel like of New Simpsons is that they run out of ideas. Like it's hard to write, you know, 600 episodes of anything. Mm -hmm. And I always, so I get so surprised how they seem to split up ideas into the same episode. Like Hunger Games yeah. has four movies. Mad Max has four movies. Like both of those are super <laughs> rife to make like, you know, and they're whatever. very different movies yeah, with their own like specific things to parody. Yeah. For what, like, even though it's not like a horror movie, like you could very much have a Mad Max parody segment in that would fill up one. Yeah. Or, or just like yeah. have a have a treehouse of horror that's like three sci fi world parodies. Like you do one yeah. of your episodes as Mad Max, your second episode is the Hunger Games, your third one is a Harry Potter. Yeah. I don't know, which I'm sure they've yeah. already done. No. Yeah, yeah, in this have. episode alone, have the first segment, Hunger Games, second one, go to your Mad Max, third one, be Snowpiercer, yeah. Yeah. when everything's frozen. Perfect. Definitely. It's just so bizarre to me. It's that they, interesting. It's different. That they yeah. take something that I think is a perfectly workable idea, like Mad Max parody and Hunger Games parody, and essentially waste them by putting them together, because it's like... Now you've created one episode, but you can't. Now you can't do a Mad Max parody later no. as a full episode because you've already done it. I don't know. I just I always think that's very yeah. odd. Not exactly. Yeah, they still have plenty of ideas. They have too many ideas. Yeah. They're just not developing any of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, as is yeah a common complaint with us is that reviewing episodes, it's like they have like five premises that they could yep. have made five episodes out of, and in a show that is like desperately clinging to any idea, it's so weird that they burn so many. Like yeah, yeah. All right. Well, uh, we'd like to sort of go through the segments as well and give like just a quick ranking for each one. Like this isn't the official rankings. Uh, so, yeah, feel free to be a bit more esoteric. Um, so, yeah, if I was ranking this segment and this segment alone, I think I'd give it a failure. How about you, BT? Uh, I, I felt so little, but I was in that mindset of is this better to give it a failure or is it worse to give it a participant by the sense that I cared so little I don't even hate it? Um, mm. And I'm I'm going to participate just because at this point I was just numb. I didn't feel anything. <laughs> All right, Steve. <laughs> so it had the same effect as heroin. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Yeah. No, I've heard heroin feels really good. <laughs> yeah. Well, initially. Uh, anyway, 
thumbs down. This was a failure of a segment. Yeah, agree. Yeah. Failure. Uh, nothing really to salvage out of this one, and and just yeah, like like what he said, burned a lot of good ideas that they could have done later. All right, and the second segment. Oh, I be- can't believe we were only like one fucking segment through. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> through nine. <laughs> Oh, I, I gotta say though, I don't have very many notes for the next two, so yeah, I assume we'll get through it pretty quickly. Uh, so BFF, RIP, Lisa's imaginary friend Rachel, played by Sarah Silverman, goes around killing people. Mm. Hey, what do we think? Uh, it was nice to see. It was kind of funny to see Janie at the start as like l- actually being Lisa's best friend, since I felt like yeah. that was a recurring joke in episodes. Is Lisa's friend mm. Janie, but we never actually saw her. Right. Yeah, yeah. She's always just kind of around. She doesn't get a line though, does she? No. <laughs> no. We we got to see the whole extended Sherry and Terry family, her which like a minor laugh out of that. And I like the names I, that rhymed. I like the idea that they hired Drew Carey just because his name rhymed. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. They went to that much effort to dust Drew Carey off from whatever he's doing, but he's hosting the price is right. Oh, that's what he's doing. Yeah. Okay. I haven't, yeah. I haven't seen it. Yeah. There good was a, him. there a was a fun moment where uh, RuPaul was like a celebrity guest on The Price Is Right, where if he wins, he gives his money to charity. Mm. And um, sorry, I, I apologize if I'm misgen- misgendering RuPaul, but they said that their charity was Planned Parenthood. Oh. And many of the target audience Ooh. and Drew Carey looked very uncomfortable. He was anticipating <laughs> yeah. the, the blowback that was inevitable, and then it happened. Oh boy, so, he could just see the you, letter RuPaul. writing campaign. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Sorry, that's a. That, I guess it shows the how. Resonant this episode was as we as I decided yeah. I'd rather no, talk uh, about RuPaul. Yeah, well, I was right. I was distracted trying to figure out if this was a parody of something. I don't think this is. I think it's an original idea, which I yeah. kinda, I preferred. Like, I, yeah, it, but it also is confusing because the first segment and then the Planet of the Couches was so heavy on parody that you kind of assume that all of them are going to be parodies. That's what I was mm-hmm. distracted by. But I, also just the fact that, again, they just forgot to write any jokes here. It's it's just not funny. Oh, my gosh. And there's, like, a se- there's a couple segments here that are just upsetting in a very unfunny way, like when Milhouse is strangled by the plastic yeah. wrap. Yeah. And Lisa that does noise. nothing to help him. Yeah, <laughs> it's just, I guess the quote-unquote joke is, why did my mom double rap? But just to see a kid getting suffocated, and then there's that horrible scene where the imaginary friend is trying to throw a knife at Marge, mm. oh, and yeah. Snowball just jump the cat just jumps in front of the knife and lands in the trash, and then Homer takes the trash out. Again, like, like, I don't no have joke a, there. That's I don't have just, a problem no. with like the cat sacrificing herself as some kind of bit. Or like, a, but you need but something to make bit? it funny. Like, yeah, did you just show happened. a cat get? Like, it was like a cat got stabbed. Ha 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 ha! <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 <laughs> if someone in what? your writer's room says, "You know what I think is funny? Cat murder." You need to <laughs> fire that writer. <laughs> yeah, fuck <laughs> off! Oh my god, it was not funny. I was genuinely getting a little upset that like they just yeah. kind of killed this cat for no reason. Like, thank God it's non canonical. No, and, like, story-wise, like, they were almost getting to somewhere where, like, Wiggum's on the case and he's really investigating it, but it'd just go to these stupid things like him getting stuck in an acronym and then he got unceremoniously <laughs> shanked while he's trying know. to explain to Ralph what dinner is. Oh, that that bit was so weird where he was, Snake was going to shiv Wiggum and then he kept explaining mm. to Ralph what the sun going down meant and it's like, why are you spending your time with this? It felt so... Yeah, I don't know. So many jokes that take a long time and then go nowhere are very bizarre. Yeah. I did find Wiggum's insistence to turn things into acronyms. I did find that pretty funny because I have occasionally yeah. tried to do that myself. Yeah. And start an acronym and then get halfway through and realize yeah. I, can't, I don't know how to finish. That was it. that was a running so. bit uh, when we we were talking about the game MRC on our Nintendo sixty four show because we could never remember what that was short for. So it was always like yeah. Monkey Wrestling Championship. I don't know. Yeah, I yeah, like wrestling a, with an R. Wrestling with an R. Wrestling. I do like uh, lose bit of hey you got yourself into this acronym. I'm not getting you out. It's like, yeah. <laughs> I always I just enjoy. Enjoy the, I Lou is a fun character. Lou's always I, Lou funny. always yeah. is funny. And, and I like the delivery. Uh, Lou and Wiggum have kind of become just a bickering couple yes. as the show has gone on, and that works. That's a funny dynamic. I, very I, must have a new voice now. I wonder yeah. who the oh, new yeah. voice for Lou is. Yeah. Oh, oh, um, the guy from Becca is doing it now. Uh, Alex Dessert or something. I think his oh. name is. I feel like oh, I remember right. making fun of that name previously. So yeah. Yeah, <laughs> right. Des- I, I not fun. It's like it's too good dessert. It's like you have the perfect name for any pickup line. 
Yeah, <laughs> but there's a little accent there, so it might be Desai or something. I don't know. No, but- has to be change it to Desai. <laughs> <laughs> well, like, and you know, we have Sarah Silverman in here, who I think is actually a very good voice actress, just like from the mm-hmm. the Wreck It Ralph movies and everything like oh, that. Yeah. She's really not given much of anything to do here. It kind of takes a while for you to re- even realize it's her. I did not know it was her. Yeah, and just uh, like I just assumed immediately. Oh, hello, guest voice. Who? How are you? <laughs> yeah, I just I I didn't get the logic of this skit that like Lisa can just imagine stuff. And then her way of getting rid of Rachel is just imagining her being older and marrying a dentist. Like what? Yeah, that was my problem as well. It's like, she's not gone. She's just different. If anything, she's still able to kill people. It makes yeah. no yeah. sense. And yeah, it really makes the whole Homer's deus ex hot dog friend feel extra pointless. And I was, I was down for deus ex hot dog. I'm like, sure, yeah, right. Sergeant Sausage, let's do this. Sergeant Sausage is like my only positive note in this entire episode. I yeah. like how beady his little eyes were. Like he didn't have normal Simpson eyes. He just had little yeah. cartoon eyes. But, but again, like, you know, he, he zips up his bun. Like, I, what, yeah. I don't know. There's no real internal logic with any of that. And I know that's weird to be nitpicking that part of the character, but like... Mm-hmm. And also, yeah, Homer eating him right out of the microwave and apparently he's not exploded now because he's talking to... It makes Just no like, sense. Then what are you eating? But it's like, imagination, shut up. <laughs> it is a good way to remind yourself to like cut a slit in sausages before microwaving them. Like, that is a good... Oh, that is, PSA. you know... Uh, yeah, you yeah. Will- Break your microwave and ruin your sausages. Exactly. I want a hot dog now. Mm, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think that does it. Yeah. If you were to rank yeah. uh, BFF RIP in this segment alone, what would you give it, BT? Uh, I'm just going to quickly throw to a line I quite liked, which was um, they escape in the used harmonica bin. I oh, liked yeah. It pretty good. Yeah, that was okay. That was decent. Yeah. But for an episode that had that bit, which I liked, and Sergeant Sausage, which was the best part of this episode, I'm going to fail this one because it's just so rushed and I what I- what is even going on? And by the time you have any context for anything, it's over. Mm. Is, so is failure, uh, I hated it. Are these relative to the other episodes or the other segments, or is it no, just uh, on their own? Okay, failure. I appreciated that it was it had its own story line yeah. as opposed to just being a parody and reference to something else, but it was still not very good. What about you, Steve? Uh, you know what? If you're going to kill an adorable animal in something, you better follow it up with three movies of Keanu Reeves getting violent revenge <laughs> for it. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, don't even put it in here. Yeah, no. You you killed a cat for no good reason. F. Mm. Failure. Oh, you've just reminded me. They're going to do a John Wick parody in a couple oh, of years. Yeah. Probably in five years' time when it's really irrelevant. Oh, oh, yeah, <laughs> Christ. Ten years. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I'm failing it as well. Although, yeah, uh, throwing to another joke I did like, which was Lisa's Dark Thoughts, where she's driving around in like this big uh, youth, But That didn't uh, make any truck. goddamn sense. Why is she hey, running I mean, over her bullies, okay, and also saxophones? And well, he's got a deer that, tied to the front of the truck. I don't know. It looks like my, Buddha. Oh. Was she running over Buddha? Yeah, she's running oh, over, did she run all over all the Buddha? Th- yeah, I was that. running over was, all the things that she doesn't Kenny. believe in. Oh. It was all the things she believes oh. in is sacrificing them. Like she was running over saxophones and running over Buddha. Okay, and had a had oh. a deer strapped to the front of her car. So it was yeah, deep okay, down. I don't like that now. <laughs> deep, yeah, deep down, Lisa wants to kill animals and Buddha. Apparently. Yeah, but again, like you barely see that this is Buddha. Like it, it's just like he's he's sucked under the grill too quickly. That was probably like, a note from yeah. the sensor. We, can't, we, can't, we can't see too much of Buddha getting sucked yeah, under may, the grill. Maybe don't assassinate I, someone's deity, yeah. huh? But we can slow motion murder a cat. That we can yeah. do. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All right, and the final segment. Uh, it, what's I don't even Mo remember. Finger. Mo Finger. Oh, yeah. Okay, like, you could have said <laughs> anything at this point, and I would have been like, oh, yeah, that was the final segment, because I make, had totally forgot. A hilarious parody of everyone's favorite horror movie, The Kingsman. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, is that what it's doing? With a title that's meant to be Goldfinger, but sounds more like Bowfinger. <laughs> So this is just already a mess by the title screen. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And also, if you're making fun of the Kingsman, just lean into it. Just do all Kingsman or do all Bond. Like, what are we doing? Again, I mean, Kingsman is already like a parody of Bond. It kind of is. Right. Yeah. So it's already kind of redundant. Because I I haven't seen the kids, and I just thought this was a James Bond parody. So like, I thought Homer was doing like a Doctor No. So is yeah, it just a bit of a well that, spy suit? Yeah, that's it's. I think that's it. I think it's spy suit because the bit in the beginning with Mo locking the doors and then throwing the glass that's straight from Kingsman. Mm-hmm. But then yeah, it turns into Bond like pretty immediately. 
I don't know. This was like even that. It was just all over the place for me. I just I didn't know what the story thread really I'm, was. I'm honestly struggling to remember specific things that happened in it. Just finished watching okay, it. Okay, I enjoyed <laughs> the Steely Dan jokes. That's it. Because that's it. that felt like it was a parody of something real, as lame as it is. Was that old people like Steely Dan? Yeah, and they, and well, I they, do too, but... Um, yeah, I think I agree with you. I think the Steely Dan jokes were the funniest bits in this entire mm-hmm. episode because they were zeroing in on something very specific Yes, and showing some reverence for it. Like, I like the whole extended fight scene to... What's the song? Babylon Queen Babylon or something? Babylon Sisters. Babylon Sisters. And then the mm. fight scene ends, and he's like, well, we still haven't even gotten to the lyrics. Yeah, like, to the, which start, is, to the yeah. beginning of the song. <laughs> which is a very specific Steely Dan reference. Like, yes. yeah, so... Yeah. I don't know. And good old Donald Fagan as well, another guest star for this episode. Yeah, to, he, he, yeah. Did, he, said he had nothing funny to say in the episode. He was very lifeless about it but it is i just appreciate Mm. it when i mean that's like the heart of what satire parody is like they're not really making a judgment on whether or not steely dan is a good or a bad band but they are pointing out like old like easy listening jazz fans jazz rock fans are like the target demo yeah and the songs take a really long time to start like these are funny bits about steely dan it it is yeah i mean steely dan is a band that continues to have like a big fan base but mm-hmm. their appeal is very esoteric and hard to explain to anybody. <laughs> sure. And they, I think they tapped into what that I- vibe is, mm-hmm. like, really well. Yeah, but I still don't know from this whole thing, like, why did Bart have to kill everybody there? And so like, that uh, is... Because there's a scene in Kingsman where they fight, like, a religious zealot group, and that's this. Yeah. I really don't like the movie Kingsman. It's, mm, um, no. I, th- that in the movie Kick-Ass, the, are they the Mark Millar things? I think, someone, I think I think they are both Mark Millar, and I think it's the same director for two okay. of them. Yeah, he, there's a very cavalier attitude of people just sort of dying as like a very jokey thing of like because that's a big focal point scene in Kingsman of like I think it's Colin Firth sort of mm-hmm. like he gets put in like the Southern Baptist Church mm-hmm. where all of them get sort of mind controlled. And then there's this long fight scene of him just sort of mowing these people down. And, like, obviously design is they're supposed to be, like, shitty people because they're part of this, like, horrible church. Yeah. But, like, it is still kind of a gross scene that I have a lot of trouble with. And this is doing very much that same thing, but they have it set to Babylon Sisters, which I I think is funny. It just, like, I still find the scene upsetting even if it's, like, as The Simpsons. Like, to see Bart, like impaling just other residents, like just mm. this massive group like of Simpsons gutting, members. Gutting mm-hmm. Nelson with a candy apple? Is that what he was doing? Yeah. Well, that's what it looked like. Yeah, yep. exactly. It just like, oh, so this Nelson's is just, a Steely just Dan a fan as well? Like, <laughs> yeah, apparently. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. True. He, he shows up for that. Yeah, but to give you an idea of how little story matters in this segment, Mo, his mentor, dies in this fight scene, and you don't actually see it. You see his corpse as a you know in the background at the end. You're like, yeah. Right. Oh wait, right. what are we doing? Oh, now he's on a raft with Sherry. Oh, now it's over. Okay. Well, cool. I like that. I felt like that was a pretty good. Cause so many Bond episodes end with some sort of horrible pun, and I felt like right. that was yeah. on on par with he's having a little Sherry. Was on par with many of the great. Which I mean, not great end of Bond yeah. moments. But yeah. also, the joke still here is that a ten year old is about to have sex with another ten year old in a raft, uh, <laughs> which is still not great <laughs> optically. Yeah. Uh, no, the only joke I liked out of this whole thing was like, oh, fingerprint scanner, height of technology, pass me my toolbox. Just oh, it with oh tool yes, box. that was. Pretty I thought good. that was a good misdirect, but otherwise, yeah, I had nothing. I for mean, this that's segment. that's very much the same joke of when Homer gets the book "How to Tunnel Out of Prison" mm-hmm. and uses yeah. it to knock out mm-hmm. Hans Molman. It's the but same. But those yeah. jokes always make me laugh. It's a always. funny. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah, that's a very like. I feel like that's kind of a Schwartz Weldery kind of style joke. Hmm. Yeah. And yeah, the, the big note of bad things that I had for this one, though, besides the ultra pointless violence, was yeah, and our agent Highball does an excellent Michael Caine impression. <laughs> he did not. That no, was terrible. I wrote down the same thing. I wrote down literally the same thing. Uh, yeah, I, I, and it's Dan Castellaneta has played that character in the yeah. past, like in Burns' air, and it was a much better Michael Caine impression back then. I don't know what happened. Yeah. I guess he just hasn't dusted it off in a while, but Michael Caine's not a hard impression to do, and I feel like... Just to lead it up with, it's good. Why yeah. is Michael Caine not in this episode? Is he just too expensive? Like, I'm sure Michael, he's, Michael Caine's got to have been on The expensive. Simpsons, right? 
Uh, yeah. I mean, has he ever been on it? I don't oh, know. That would be weird if he hasn't. I feel like Michael Caine's been on ever so many things. Yeah. yeah. They might have so blown many. the budget because <laughs> there's so many guest stars in this episode. Yeah. Drew Carey, Donald Fagan, Kelsey Grammer, Maurice LaMarche, Judith Owen, Sarah Silverman. Like, oh, yeah. They used, yeah. I, I forget. Yeah. Like, they used Kelsey Grammer for like one line. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. Judith Owen, I had to look her up. She is uh, Harry Shearer's wife, and she's doing like a Shirley Bassey impression. For this like really again it's yeah. just a lazy song because it's like the whole thing is a parody saying like uh, uh talking about 600 episodes but then you end on the same last line as the goldfinger song like he loves gold yeah. i'm like what did we just run out of a rhyme like uh. it also felt very yeah. odd that this after this sort of giant crazy mess of an episode they spent talking about it ended by them listing a bunch of other shows that were bad. Yeah. The implication being like, we're so great. These shows were terrible. Yeah. It's like, like, okay, I don't know, Simpsons. You're not really earning my, yeah. my kudos here with what you just showed me. Yeah. Congratulations. Um, you're better than celebrity boxing, yeah. I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but I mean, wasn't, weren't, weren't some of them made up on the show? Like they were internally Simpsons shows, but then some of them were real. And I was just I think they were all real. They were all real. Yeah. yeah. All but right, but cool. some of them, they were poking fun of themselves by putting the critic and uh, Futurama in there both well when they put shows. Futurama in there I got real mad <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah I mean it was obviously just a jab at graining yeah I think was it Mike Reese who did the critic or was it Al Jean who did yeah. the it was both uh, it was both. Both, oh, both of them yeah so yeah and, it just sort of himself. feels mean because yeah in a bunch of those shows were like shows that had one or two seasons that people actually really like and were like always like it is a shame that they got cut down so mm-hmm. quickly because they could have yeah. uh, no. 600 episodes Elliot yeah <laughs> yep, yep. Grown and developed more than The Simpsons have in the past 20 years. Um, all right. Well, if you were to rank Mo Finger and Mo Finger alone, what would you give it, Steve? Uh, this, I think this is the best of the three, but I'm still going to give it a failure because, like, they just don't capitalize on anything. Uh, yeah. Like like I said, they set up Mo to be, like, this genius, and then they don't do anything with it. Like you said, he dies yeah. off screen. You don't even... You don't even follow up with that at all. And, yeah, the Steely Dan stuff is on point, but I still think this is a failure. Woody. Yeah, agreed with Steve. I would have liked them to like have a regular episode where I don't know Lisa gets really into like jazz rock or something and goes to a Steely Dan concert as <laughs> that like could a happen. plot point. But uh, no, this is a failure. BT. Yeah, echoing the same point. It had the most potential, but they spend so little time letting anything breathe that any kind of final parody from this just dies. So failure. Yeah. yeah, I'm failing it as well. Like I forgot to mention with the song as well. Yeah, the lyrics were just dog shit, but. <laughs> Um, I did like the visuals of like the kaleidoscope sideshow Bob. I thought there was some yeah. pretty clever things going on there, but yeah, ultimately, who gives a shit? <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, look, let's rank this thing on the Simpsons Index. We rank using our six point scale, which starts down the bottom at failure. Maybe if the episode was just meh, you give it a participant. But for the positive rankings, you got OK Bronze, Good Silver, Excellent Gold, but for the best of the very best, you give Cubic Zirconia. I'm going to go first. Let me show you how it's done. Yep, you could probably guess from my three fails for each segment that I am <laughs> failing this one as what he was saying before it's hard to remember a lot of modern simpsons but i think this is the worst treehouse of horror that i've ever seen (laughs) bt what do you reckon i'm a little bit different in the sense that um i don't think it's the worst i've seen but i started off bored and it just never got any better and by the end it was the kind of bored where i was irritated Mm. so yeah i'm gonna go off straight failure as well i would have really enjoyed if you'd been like well i gave the all three segments a failure but you know what bronze (laughs) that would have been funny (laughs) <laughs> no, um, it's just, I'm going to struggle to remember why I failed it until I watch it again and go, oh, that's why, because it's all rushed and boring. Yeah. Mm. Steve, what do you reckon? Yeah, failure for me as well. I think this really kind of encapsulates like the indifference that The Simpsons shows, like yeah. after you get past season 25 or something. It's just, it's all rushed. No one really gives a shit, and they're just not even bothering to try and be funny at this point. I don't know if this is the worst Treehouse of Horror, but I, I can't think of any worse ones off the top of my head. So. Sure. I'll Have you seen that. the one where Homer eats himself? That, that one is that one though. We did complain about like not remembering any of it. I I saw that episode too, yeah. and I remember that episode. I I I like, that episode. I, yeah. I'm like, man, I, that was fucking gross. Yeah. And this episode, yeah. I didn't remember any of the segments. Um, so I'm giving it a failure as well. Um, I think I feel like the recurring theme here is just the speed 
and pacing that this episode goes at just makes yeah. it feel like a just chaotic mess. Yeah, like yeah. they're just they're just rushing to get it done. Yeah, that was something I wanted to add. For something where the speed is so breakneck to also be boring, that actually seems like it would be hard to do. And yeah, yet they managed. Yeah, I, I was worried for a second that uh, when we started this episode that it was going to be the one where Homer is eating himself. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to have to watch <laughs> that one again. So I was glad it wasn't. <laughs> No, I'm showing a little bit of mercy, even though I still delivered you guys a unanimous failure, Treehouse of Horror. We are giving this episode the the Index index Finger! finger. (laughs) It will be the third Treehouse of Horror that we've given unanimous failure. It'll be joining Treehouse 26 and 28, which uh, 28 was the Homer Eats Himself one. So (laughs) there's a real run of bad Treehouse of Horrors. But Mm. you know what? For the Simpsons Index, at least, that is the last HD Treehouse of Horror that we have to review. Wow. I mean, they're going out on a high note. They're going to make more of them. You know this, right? Yeah. (laughs) I hate to break Uh, through this bad news. Oh, yeah. That's a qualifier. Well, wait. What is the next era called if it's not the HD era? Disney. Ah, Disney. Yeah, of course. Oh, okay. Yeah, it makes Uh, sense. And we've also nicknamed it the Depression. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The 30s. (laughs) All right. Well, yeah, that about does it for that Treehouse of Horror. Now we're going to the teens era to review season 15's Treehouse of Horror 14. We will be back. And we are back and we just watched our teens era episode. This was season 15, episode 1, Treehouse of Horror 14. First released in November of 03. It was directed by Stephen Dean Moore, written by... John Swartzwalder! Um, Actually, so you've trapped me with this one so many times, I don't trust you anymore. (laughs) Yeah, especially with an episode focused on John Frink, I usually do that misdirect, but no, this was a Swartzy episode, one of his last. All three segments? Apparently. Oh, wow. Because, yeah, they started handing it off to one writer around the teens era. Before that, yeah, it usually used to be one Mm. writer per segment. And it shows. Uh, yeah, overall impressions. Uh, what did we think of this one? Uh, Frankenstein and Reaper Madness and Stop the World I Want to Goof Off. What did we think? Uh, well, just to speak to what we were saying before of uh, actually being able to remember things, the second this episode started up, I was like, oh, this is one where Homer goes, I wish I was death again. That was cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I really like that line. <laughs> I think it's one of the only times that a Treehouse of Horror segment has referenced another Treehouse of Horror segment. Ah, uh, surely not. Uh, but mm. anyway, I- I'd still really pop for that line. I enjoy it. Mm-hmm. What do you guys think? Big breath of fresh air after the last one. Uh, oh, yeah. I, I, mm. This is one I've seen many times, both like on DVD and in syndication and things like that. I, I think it's a really strong one across the board. Yeah, it was nice to be reminded that this is a show that I like. After that last one we watched, I'm like, yeah. did I ever like The Simpsons? Yeah, and yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, okay. It does have that kind of corrupted Wait a influence. Second. It's like, yeah. was it? I all- enjoy this show. Yeah. yeah. No, it's the children who are wrong. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I will say, I don't think it was one of the funniest Treehouse of Horrors, mm. but like, it was coherent. It was coherent. The stories all they set up their rules in the universe and they do riff on it well, I think, even though yeah, I, I think there are some particular low moments in this as well, but yeah Cohesive is such an improvement from the last one. I mean, I think oh my, the, yes. the weakest part of this entire episode is the very beginning. I think the cold mm. open just doesn't really land yeah. because it's like the joke here is just that like a childish fight gets like really weirdly violent and then like like Marge just comes in and shoots everyone to end it. Like, mm. yeah, the, it didn't land. The theme of whenever the Simpsons inflict violence on each other, aside from Homer strangling, never, never really plays as being yeah. funny. No, right. and even like I'll, the so, eye rolly joke of Grandpa being burnt and going, "I'm still cold." Like, yeah. I liked Marge coming in and saying, stop fighting and burning. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> that was pretty funny. Sorry, what were you going to say, BT? I was literally going to reference that same grandpa line, which I kind of oh. like. I think it's just the delivery on it. It mm. works. Yeah, fair enough. Um, but yeah, it is a bit horrifying having Homer go, beat the lumps, beat the lumps. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a good but, line, uh, but Well, that, they try to soften that by having Bart just being like, oh, cowabunga, don't have a cow. <laughs> like, you know, not being screaming in agony. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at least. And at least it wasn't a, you know, two-part couch gag each with mm-hmm. its own, you know, individual parts in it. It was just, this is the open, boom, we're in. Yeah, literally boom. Yep. <laughs> so yeah, we start off with our first segment, Reaper Madness, Homer Become Death. What do we think? 
the the biggest problem I had with this is that Family Guy did this episode already, like a couple years before mm. oh, this yeah. happened. Like I I forget what they were calling their little anthology things, but they would do kind of a similar treehouse thing where they would break it up into. But actually, no, I think I, I'm I'm wrong about that. I think this was a full canonical episode where Peter yeah, because death, death became for a, while. a character. Because yeah, the first one yeah. he was voiced by Norm Macdonald, and then mm-hmm. from then on, after that he was voiced by Adam Carolla. Yeah, that's right. And I think in that episode, Peter didn't want to kill the cast of Dawson's Creek. Yeah. And in this one, he doesn't yeah. want to kill Marge. But I, I want to say this is a Twilight Zone parody one way or the other, right? Like, do you, are you familiar with this source? I don't know. BT? <laughs> uh, not from the episodes I've seen, but I've still not seen the last season, so... Yeah, I feel like this is referencing something specific, but I don't know what. I mean, I think this is a funny yeah. bit. Like, I think I this, think this only, whole sequence is funny. My only real problem on this one is it kind of just ends. But that said, I do love uh, Homer riding a motorcycle away from God who still gets stopped <laughs> by a train. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was great. But I mean, this one feels connected to The Simpsons as a whole, where the last episode we watched was just a bunch of random shit happening. This isn't if what would happen if someone became death. This is what would happen if Homer Simpson became death. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he's as irresponsible with this responsibility as he is like when he buys a gun, you know, yeah. like he, he's just <laughs> completely indifferent and, and chaotic with it. Why do you think death was coming for Bart in the first place? Like what was going to actually kill Bart? Oh, yeah. Then? Oh, yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Bart does a lot of shit stuff that could kill him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, there's no follow up on that one. It then becomes, yeah, Homer has to is in charge of killing Marge. It's mm-hmm. yeah. Weird that they didn't circle back to that. Yep, if it has a problem, it's its internal consistency of it looks like death just chooses who to kill, whereas other times it's like people die mm. and death is meant to, you know, rape them. But right. uh, yeah. again, it, it's, I, at least it's funny. Yeah, I think that this episode is a good counterpoint just because they really they have an idea that's, you know, a one that is very expandable of what if Homer were death or mm-hmm. what if death was a real person in Springfield. And then they expand it in, like, a lot of funny ways, as opposed to just instantly moving to, like, great, we've showed a picture of Homer wearing the death robe, let's move on to some other, like, parody to do. It's like, no, like, you're going to sit in it for a little bit. And I thought the bit of Lisa bringing Homer to class for, like, a... uh, That was so funny. It's very funny. And I think it's also a good counterpoint. We were so down on the joke where um, the cat dies in the last episode, and this has an equally upsetting premise where... Miss Hoover says, does someone want to see yeah. <laughs> Lisa's dad reap his soul? And then they bring in this homeless guy who said, it's gonna, I heard something about a free meal. And that is a, like that is an equally dark joke as the cat just dying, but it is handled much better. Like, you still feel weird about seeing it, but, like, the camera cuts away and you just have to hear the kids cheering, which is a joke. Like, the, it's, 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 it's funny. It's, it's a it's setup dark. with a premise and a payoff. Yeah. Whereas the cat getting stabbed is just a thing that happened. This yes. is like, what would happen if death went to a, a school? Like, how would he demonstrate his powers? Like, how would they get somebody in here to do it? It all makes sense. Yeah. It all tracks and it's well constructed. The sounds of they've gotten a lot of mileage out of those kids. Uh, the sound of those kids cheering. It was like when. Yeah. The, the robot attacks Skinner and he's like, help children, they're killing me. Yay! <laughs> Yay. <laughs> yeah, that cheering always makes me laugh. It's always a good bit. Yeah. It's almost a shame that this segment was kind of limited by, you know, the time frame of a treehouse of mm-hmm. horror because, like, I think there was something interesting for them to explore in a world without death and we kind of only yeah. get two sequences and one, I think, with Frankie the Squealer getting shot up is really funny and then yeah. I really didn't like the Mo one. Oh yeah, the, the after a certain point, like Mo just became a vehicle for suicide jokes, which yeah. aren't funny, and it, it just it's I don't know they they just they they lay a lot of this like weird kind of um, yeah. stigmatizing mental health stuff on Mo, which I've never liked. I do yeah. like Sammy the Squeal. I was like, why won't you die? I tell I tell you, I swear. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They've got I I love that Frankie Tight Lips and Johnny the Squealer have become like recurring bits because they're. They're one-note characters by definition, but you get a lot of comedy just by contrasting the two of them. Like, one guy always says no to something, one guy always says yes to something. Mm, I think that's just a funny bit for, like, side characters. Yeah, unfortunately, The Simpsons in their later seasons would overstep this. Like, we watched an episode recently where Johnny Tightlips uh, usurps Fat Tony and at the end explains his entire plan. Yeah. They keep making him talk. The one thing he's not supposed to do, and they have him do it. Oh, damn it. (laughs) 
Yeah, yeah. it's disappointing. But Homer yeah. like mowing his way through the entire uh, uh, stadium to get better seats, killing the queen. Mm-hmm. Like that's very yeah. in- it's just the wealthy dowager. Oh, the wealthy yeah. dowager. Yeah, but it's <laughs> it's very in keeping with Homer's character that he would just thoughtlessly like mow through all these people. Like, you know, and I I always like the presentation of death is like a nine to five job. Like, I think it's funny whenever that trope comes up, it's like, Oh, this is just a guy punching a clock, you know? And Mm -hmm. yeah, he, he just, he wakes up, he puts on his robe one arm at a time, like anybody (laughs) else. (laughs) Oh yeah. I just realized, yeah, this is a Homer jobs episode. Didn't he? Yeah. (laughs) He's not getting paid. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, did anyone have any more notes about this episode? Uh, this segment rather Uh, just the great, uh, final chase scene with God. I think a BT already touched on it, but I think it's really funny. Uh, I like, I like just like the idea of someone being able to, outrun god on a motorcycle <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, and also i just like the quick back and forth where homer's like i've done your dirty work now release me from this terrible vocation no oh come on <laughs> oh all right yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm too old and rich for this <laughs> yeah oh, and the whole benny hill sequence being chased by death and the doors that's classic hated it i oh, hated really? it <laughs> really the benny hill uh, well has been rung dry it is definitely point. dry but you have to remember, this was 15 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Might have still been dry even at that point. Might have that's, been. That's, yeah, that's Benny that. Hill was from the 70s, right? I don't know. My dad mm. liked it. That's that's my only reference for Benny Hill. <laughs> he made us watch like a best of VHS once, and we just did not get it at He's all. He's always trying to like spy on ladies undressing, right? Isn't yeah, yeah. And then cops are always trying to stop him. And then sometimes he does this Chinese voice. It's really unfortunate. Oh, great. It sounds, oh, yeah. it sounds like it's aged very well. Aged, aged like a fine wine yeah. made of shit. <laughs> like a fine milk. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a fine milk. Oh, goodness. Uh, all right. Well, if you were going to rank this segment, this segment alone, what would you give it, BT? Um, um, I think about a bronze. Like, uh, yeah, it's just, it needed a little bit more time to breathe, a few more jokes. Uh, there are some jokes that really land differently now. Uh, but mm. overall, I had a good time. Yeah, I'm probably there as well. I want to kind of edge it up to silver, but like, yeah, this is going to be a recurring thing. I think I've had more fun with this Treehouse of Horror in the past. But anyway, what do you reckon, Steve? Yeah, I think probably a, a strong bronze, I think. Yeah, because yeah, like you said, a couple of the jokes fall a little flat, but mm-hmm. I like this premise, and I think it's funny, and I like that it's tied to the character. I'll, I'm right there with you guys. It was This episode as a whole, and I mean, it was very consistent. Mm-hmm. Like, I liked all these segments, and this one I liked too. I don't... I feel like what this episode lacks, and I was so down on the parodies from the last one, but there's not really like a sketch here where you like immediately you're like, oh yeah, that was the blank Treehouse of Horror. Like that was the Treehouse yeah. of Horror where all the mascots come alive and they sure. play a jingle. Yeah. That was the one where the lunch lady's trying to kill everyone. Like these things have like images that stick in your head. Whereas that I didn't remember really any of these segments, even though I liked them all. Right. And, yeah. yeah. I think that's a good way to put it. All right. Well, on to the next segment, Frankenstein. Yeah, Frank's father comes back and starts stealing people's organs. Dad. <laughs> what do we think? I I really enjoy when uh, a subject of like a impression or a parody can lean into it and kind of, mm. it's funny to hear Jerry Lewis in this because he's basically yeah. doing an impression of somebody doing an impression of Jerry Lewis. Yeah, yeah. it's and a good l- get leaning into the shtick like his shtick was never like that hank azaria's version of that has always just been a really exaggerated version of jerry lewis's shtick but now he's coming in here and leaning into it and and having a good time it sounds like like oh he does a he does a great job yeah oh he's awesome yeah he obviously obviously a professional (laughs) and and many years of experience (laughs) and look he's jerry lewis is one of those guys who got so curmudgeonly and so like kind of nasty when he got old so it's nice to hear him in this like being kind of jovial and poking fun at himself and and having a good time i remember because of that like being so surprised at the time that he uh did this and he was up for this because yeah there is so much about frank that is based in like he said doing an exaggerated jerry lewis that yeah and yeah i was stoked with his performance in this episode as well yeah but they never like Go ahead. BC. So I, th- I think just quickly, the only negative, there's definitely a change in his audio quality. It feels like they may have may have recorded him somewhere else yeah. in the country. Not a huge deal. It's just I only noticed it because I'm wearing the headphones and could really like pick it out this time. Mm. Oh yeah. yeah. Do you think maybe too. he didn't want he didn't want to fly out or something? So just yeah. Like, I think so maybe that's that's often, different. I think that's studio. often true. Is like the producers mm. themselves will fly to the guest and record them somewhere instead of the guest coming. To yeah. Them. yeah. I, I yeah. believe yeah. Harry Shearer just records out of his house now. Yeah. He, yeah. Doesn't, he, even, he, he just, doesn't even go he, to right. he literally <laughs> phones it in. He literally, right? Yeah. Yeah, he literally does. Yeah, Harry Shearer lives in London now, so yeah. 
Oh, and I do yeah. think Spr- that's still probably, Springfield, but London. Yeah, <laughs> probably a reason that Jerry Lewis was okay being on the show is like the show is never really made fun of Jerry Lewis. Like even mm. though the Frank nah. voice is like a parody of it, they don't like. I don't know if there's ever been a joke of like where they've said like Jerry Lewis movies aren't funny or like yeah. talked about like his crappy like public persona or something like right. that. Right. You, you you do feel like the com- the writers of the show like generally probably grew up on some of these movies and do have oh, a real sure. love for it. I'm sure they've done a Day the Clown Cried parody at this point, I right? <laughs> that, that still might be too too deep of a pull. For probably at least the Simpsons. Yeah. Simpsons well, I sort of took pretty. this as like I don't know. A very distant parody of Nutty Professor, mm. maybe. But well, yeah, that's I, what Frink is uh, yeah, like yeah. in conception. Yeah, like he kind of starts from that. Mm. The runner, or I mean, not necessarily, but the idea that what got Frink the Nobel Prize is the hammer <laughs> with a screwdriver on the back was funny for two reasons. First off, I don't think that that is actually a useful tool at all because if no. you try to use a screwdriver with something that has a yeah. big vertical handle, you're going to knock up against everything. And both, I think Steve and I's both biggest laugh during the episode was when he said, now that I have this screwdriver hammer, <laughs> yeah, I can yeah. resurrect my father. That was the thing that was holding him back. Yeah, the, the switching, yeah. Of, switching tools. of tools. Yeah, like yeah. he had all the things he needed to bring back the dead, but having to switch between a screwdriver and hammer made it not worth it. And again, to, to rip on the last episode a little bit more, because this is, again, just making me Do realize it, how shitty that episode really was. It's it just having that little callback you know, shows mm. some structure to the jokes. It's like, okay, yeah. yeah, we've got this dumb bit. Like, this could have just been a tossed off bit of like, oh, a hammer screwdriver thing. But I like that they tied it back in and just the the complete speciousness of that connection is really funny to me. It's like, yeah, oh, now that I have this stupid useless tool, I yeah. can save my father who's been hanging in this fridge for yeah. decades. Well, I think, like, yeah, you can criticize a lot about this episode, but at least each segment feels like they have a beginning, middle, and end. Like, yeah. not just a pile of thing like yeah like you say this one feels like it was written like mm. yeah yeah exactly <laughs> and like like you said about the last segment that felt like it could have almost obviously aside from the fact that homer becomes death and like the unreality of it like this one exploring a relationship between frank and his father i liked the dynamic a lot that his father was kind of like this hunky indiana jones type <laughs> i yeah. like that too. And yeah. frank that is sort cool. of the more stereotypical nerd and like if you get rid of like the father being dead and reanimated as a plot point, I mean, they've done like a bunch of episodes of people like reuniting with their father, mm. but like Frank trying to reunite with his like Indiana Jones style father, I think would have been a perfectly viable option for Absolutely. a real in canon episode. Yeah. Um, which maybe they've already done at this point as like some flashback, but Jerry Lewis is long dead at this and point. I like that they established mm. too that like Frank's dad doesn't become super strong and powerful from being reanimated or from having this like metal thing in his side. Like when you first see him on the boat, he's picking up gigantic crates and like yeah. uh, the anchors and shit. He and picks throwing up the it anchor and throws it on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's just like freakishly strong from the get go. It serves it well to have it within the tree house of horror structure. Cause yeah, I agree. It, it probably was like started out as its own Simpsons episode, but probably didn't have enough to sustain. And like for mm. this, it can get all, you know, far out and wacky and sci fi and yeah, have ridiculous things like Frank's father just pulling out Skinner's spine and that just works. <laughs> like, I do love yeah. uh, Skinner's line of, hey, you can't have that. Yeah. <laughs> I want to hear that in the next Mortal Kombat. That'd be good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> That'd be amazing. And then we get a little bit of Flanders. Like in this era, I think is when they started yeah. making Flanders really yeah, lean into yeah. being like a fundamentalist Christian, not just like mm-hmm. a love thy neighbor, you know, because that's, I think that's the direction Christianity in general was trending in that era, you know? And yeah. uh, so it's funny to hear that it was like, oh, yeah, I just did a walk for the cure for a homosexuality. And it also makes us feel a little better that he got like lots of his organs ripped out. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, it's a shame, the whole Flanderization thing, and, like, this became the character point. Mm. Um, So, yeah, that line rubbed me the wrong way. And as well, Marge saying later, this is more violent than the hip-hop awards. It's just, yeah. That was a little lazy. We also, I feel like Steve and I both were big fans of uh, Jennifer Garner and the... uh, (gasps) Dudley Hirschbach, yeah. (laughs) Okay, so I I didn't know who... So that's a real... Is he a real scientist? He's he's a real guy. He's an actual Nobel laureate for, like, physics Uh, or something. Yeah, and they got his voice... Yeah, yeah, both those bit the initial up. Uh, you know, our jobs aren't so different. I disagree. 
It's just the classic opposite of yes ending. It's so good. Yeah. Oh, his his deadpan delivery was genuinely like yeah. super funny. Like they've had the scientists well. on the show before uh, yeah. who aren't as good with this. Like, you know, Stephen Jay Gould and, and Neil deGrasse Tyson, people like that. I assume mm. he's been on. <laughs> I'm sure he has. Probably. He'll be on anything. We'll probably have him on this podcast right now. Yeah. Just call him up. <laughs> he's just going to explain all the things we're doing wrong. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, scientifically, pulls out his calculator, does the maths, but this joke would, yeah. I do love, uh, the pyramids were built by Sears, and then Lisa figures that out on a calculator. It's like, he's right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I also like, yeah, Frank doing the absolute math to figure out the best way to take down his father was just to, yeah, pop him one in oh, the he kicked him in the, the ball so hard he died. <laughs> yeah, that was edited very funny, too. And Jerry Lewis's line delivery of like, uh, and now I'm going to hell. E -ah 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 dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, really good. <laughs> I really wish the episode ended there, though. I didn't need the whole soul catch a bit, and it's like, uh, oh, yeah. I need Hebrew food. Like, yeah, what? that was odd. Yeah. I, mean, I do kind of like uh, when his dad calls him something Yiddish. I do like, oh, I've waited so long to hear you say that. What does it mean? I don't like the final tag of, is it dirty? But just the idea that he's um, not even aware of what the word means, but has waited his whole life to hear it is, there's something kind of funny in that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, did we have any more notes about this episode, uh, this segment? I keep doing that. Yeah, does anyone know why the traffic cops in Sweden are nude? I think that's just, like, <laughs> the general joke about how, like, Sweden is very permissive with, with like, sex and nudity and, and uh, also the perception of, like... I think this is like a Swedish women's volleyball team joke because I think back in the <laughs> 80s there was an Olympic volleyball team from Sweden that was like unusually attractive and so that's been kind of the joke and the stereotype about Swedish women ever since. Ever since. Yeah. Yeah. No, so, I mean, to be fair, I did laugh at it but I'm also like, why, why though? Also, oh, you could tell the animators were having fun drawing a very attractive, shapely nude woman. <laughs> <laughs> they, well, they draw, like, drawing Homer all day, you're like, oh, okay. Come yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're like, yeah, my only other note is it really grated my spine hearing the MIDI version of Staying Alive. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't know why they just wouldn't just spring for different music. Like, because I spent the music budget on Blinded Me with Science by Thomas Dolby. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, then they play this Casio keyboard version of fucking Staying Alive. Ugh. Yeah, Yuck. that was a little icky, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, it's such a fucking pedantic little point that no one else would care about. But <laughs> Nerd! <I heard. laughs> All right, uh, if you were to rank Frankenstein and Frankenstein alone, what would you give a PT? Um, I think I'm going to go with Silver with this one. It has, like, the most cohesive premise. As, like we were saying, if you take out the idea that his dad was dead, this could be an episode. Um, it does have a few jokes that, again, have not dated terribly well. Some of those I'm willing to forgive for time and place, and some just are uncomfortable no matter what. Uh, but yeah, overall, I like the premise. I like. I think I just like the good uh, resurrection from the dead replacing body parts bit. I, I always enjoy that every time I see that in a movie. Yeah, this is sort of one of my turn my brain off and I have fun with it. But mm. yeah, yeah, the more I think about it, the less I like it. But I, I think know it's you probably... hate Casio keyboards. Oh, mm -hmm. so much. Yeah, for that alone, it's being bumped down to a bronze. But uh, yeah, what do you reckon, Steve? Uh, I think this is a silver for me as well. I, I uh, Yeah, for the reason said, I think that Jerry Lewis is really, really funny in this. He's having fun poking fun at himself. I like Frank as a character a lot, and he's always mm, yeah. kind of uh, sidelined. So th this is some of the most frank ex exposure you'll have in anything like the most consistent frank exposure because usually he's into like pop in deliver a line or two and then leave yeah so i, I like having a good amount of frank in here uh so so for me uh yeah this episode this, this segment was fun and pleasant but there's not really any like lines that i would go back to as being super quotable or any like uh, great moments but like it was it fit in very nicely with the whole episode and was pleasant and funny um so i'll give it a a bronze high bronze all right and on to our final segment of treehouse of horror 14 mm -hmm. stop the world i want to goof off <laughs> yeah button millhouse get a time clock thingy pause time i'm gonna say i think this was my favorite segment oh uh, really mine too the jokes the most i like the story the most out of one of uh, this yeah. one but what about you guys yeah, i like this a lot we were we were just talking about before we started what, is this a direct parody of something like I, I think I feel like we're all familiar with the premise of a watch that stops time, but I don't know why I'm familiar with that premise. Yeah, um, was the movie term, Click about this? I mean, <laughs> arguably there is a movie called Clock Stoppers, but I think that might have come out after. There's a term I really like, which is beating a dead unicorn, where you feel like mm. something is a trope, but you cannot figure out what it's a trope of. Mm. Oh <laughs> yeah, and that feels like this to me. Like oh yeah, clock that stops time. Everyone's done that. Like um, um. 
Uh, but it's been done. So <laughs> Clock Stoppers was just one year before. Okay, there uh, you go. See, I, so I, and again, I, I, I keep pulling the Twilight Zone, but I feel like this might be a Twilight Zone premise, or at least it's similar in my mm. mind to the one of like the guy who wants to be able to read or something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't be Time surprised because... I did like a Halloween trivia thing one year and I did like a whole section on Treehouse of Horrors and one of my big jokes was that do you know the direct reference that this segment is parodying and like nine of them were Twilight Zone yeah. episodes. Yeah, yeah. So it's a well that Simpsons definitely returned to so I think it'd be safe to assume. Yeah, and it's always that bit of you have phenomenal powers but it comes with this unexpected cost. That's absolutely mm. Twilight Zone's wheelhouse. I mean, this yeah. has a very similar vibe to uh, Homer Becomes the Grim Reaper in the sense mm -hmm. that it's the same basic premise of like one of the Simpsons gets like magic cosmic power and they're going to wield it in an irresponsible way. Exactly. Um, so it was, I think that they're good counterpoints to each other. Um, I also, I have a real fondness for uh, toys or like mail away toys from old comic books. Yeah. As like yeah. A, a yeah. plot point. I think those are always fun. I, I like the, it's crazy the way that it just arrives. Like he just sends in for this advertisement yeah. from the seventies, just arrives four weeks oh. later and it just works. <laughs> like the logistics, there was a comic book ad that I remember seeing in one of my old comic books where it was a magic Buddha statue. The premise being that if you rubbed the statue, you would be showered with riches. <laughs> and you're like, what is the economy of this? Because if everyone just has yeah. these magic Buddha statues, the, mm -hmm. the world economy will just collapse because they all just have <laughs> infinite money. And this is very much the same thing. If everyone spent 45 cents on these clocks that stop time, <laughs> how does anything ever function? Yeah. And, but apparently Barton Milhouse bought the first one. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I do like how all or at least most of the pranks with them do have this childlike whimsicalness about them. Oh, yeah. Just the simplicity of, yeah, Lisa picking her nose and letting Marge catch her is like really <laughs> sweet to me. And the visuals of Homer and the donuts, I love this. Oh, yeah. I think it was so well animated. Yeah, it was a great, a great runner where they keep adding more and more of when he I love the way that they go goofy when Homer's about to stab himself <laughs> and they change it <laughs> to a banana. Because they could have taken that in like a lot of mm, darker yeah. directions. Yeah, I feel like if this were made in a, a more recent season, it would all be about them like mangling each other. But yeah. the, the body horror <laughs> stuff here happens by accident. Like Homer's head falls off, but yeah. it's not because like it's not because Bart's trying to take their head off. It's just he's trying to keep he's, them clean and the head falls for a off. Long time, yeah. Then to have Nelson like just put there and then Nelson mm. be made like that. That was yeah, it was great, well timed, and it went. It was just an example of something that went on for the exact right around of time, and you're like, I'm really glad they took the time to put this in the episode. Yeah. <laughs> Instead mm. of whatever, mm. like, you know, 30-second-long Planet of the Couch gag they had. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly, and there were stakes, and there were es escalation with it as well. Like, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Mm. And I like the escalation of after the watch breaking and mm. them just going, like, they're not even too upset about it. They're just going to use it to start, like, robbing the world of great art and bringing the Pope into your house yeah. and give him a wedgie <laughs> and, like, having Oscar de la Hoya just so you can use it as a punching bag, you know? I like the way that they got the line for Oscar de la Hoya to be, wow, this kid is really fun to hit. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a funny piece of dialogue. Just the one line they gave him. It's so good. Yeah, once again, a lot of child bashing in this one. Just everyone gathering around Martin and just ruthlessly beating him. Yeah, like, that's it. It is very Springfield that they're chasing Barton Millhouse when time stops and then when it unfreezes, they're chasing Martin. But that's very Springfield in the sense of they often don't know what they're doing and can be easily misdirected. They're just an angry mob. It's yeah. like, yeah. hey, they're going to the old mill. No, we're not. Well, let's go there anyway. Get some cider. Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> And really, really good uh, Millhouse moments in this, yeah. too. Like, I love good, mm. yeah, the little dance that he does when he realizes he's the second coolest kid in the world, where he, like, licks his finger and then spins <laughs> around in a circle and, like, breaks down. Like, it's just a ridiculous dance, and I love that they spent time animating that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I also liked, you know, I thought I'd be happy to see my parents back together, but now it just feels hollow, <laughs> and he just, like, literally taped them together. Well, because the implication like... was they were in the middle of a fight right when the time yeah. stopped, so their pose just looks very unnatural yeah, yeah. um any other notes about this segment i i had forgotten that like i i was down on the first episode we watched because it had that seemingly out of place intro and then the weird shirley bassey ending but i guess that's really the setup that they've done for a lot of the treehouse of horrors because this one has that sort of unpleasant opening but then at the end you know bart gives lisa this watch that just like 
turns into this whole other segment of them all swapping to different things. Or there was that Treehouse episode where their flesh all get turned inside out and they do a little hat yeah. and cane dance. Yeah. And so I guess the really, most of these Treehouse episodes have kind of five little skits, even though the first and second are very short. Yeah, they'll but, need something to like end it on. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Uh, me, uh, sorry, Paige? Music class is now a two drink minimum. Yeah, yeah. That, was, that was a funny line. <laughs> My pants have descended. Yeah. That was a good line, too. Yeah. Yeah, Skinner had some good moments across the board in this one. Yeah, I feel like I should be way more annoyed at the cop out ending of just the we're in the hula hoop world now. But mm-hmm. yeah, it does have that sort of callback thing to other tree houses, like you were saying. Yeah. I got, yeah, massive lizard tongue vibes or yeah, yeah anything like that. Um, all right, if you were to rank Stop the World I Want to Goof Off and Stop the World I Want to Goof Off alone, what would you give it? Woody, what would you give uh, it? Gold. Yeah, gold. I, I, I liked it. I It's not one that I would even remember as one of my favorite segments, again, because it doesn't have like any super memorable images, but like a lot of the lines were really funny and the story fit together very mm-hmm. well, and it was fun to have Millhouse in there a lot. Yeah. No, I'm surprised because I was going to say the same thing. I really like this. And if I was like making a compilation of just Treehouse of Horror segments, I definitely want to include this. Uh, yeah. How about you, Steve? Same. Yeah, I'm going gold on this one as well. I think it's great. Uh, I, I love anything that messes with time. You know, I think it's always a really fun premise. And and once again, like the Grim Reaper bit, like we're tying it specifically to these characters. This feels like this is what Bart and Milhouse would do if given these powers. Like it knows... Yeah. It knows the show. It's got a good, funny structure. And uh, like Woody said, every segment has a beginning, middle, and end in this episode. I, I really like that. And BT? Uh, I'm going to sit on a bronze and just go against the grain <laughs> entirely. That, I Ooh. don't know. No particular <laughs> reason. It just uh, it didn't strike me as being as much fun. So, so no. But hey. If you, like space, if you like space in the attic, you're going to be excited. <laughs> 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 all right. Well, I think it's time to rank all of this thing. And let's kick off with you, BT. What would you like to give Treehouse of Horror 14? I'm going to give it an overall bronze. I had a reasonably good time. All right. Cool. <laughs> Succinct. Steve. Uh, I think this is all going to balance out to a silver for me. I think uh, this is one of the rare tree houses where every segment got like a little better, um, which I I really appreciate. And I think these are all really strong. And Woody, what would you like to give Treehouse of Horror 14? Yes, I am right there where with Steve was uh, with a nice a nice silver. Um, I'll, I liked all these segments a lot. Like none of them were like super memorable, but I thought they were all very consistent and like this this would be like a standard of quality where if every episode of The Simpsons was at this standard, like it was just a very pleasant place of like, yeah, that was a fine episode of The Simpsons yeah. that I would happily rewatch, even if it's not like stuck in my mind as an all time great. Yeah. Um, I wrestled with this one a bit because I'd like to give it silver because like I generally mm. give Treehouse of Horrors just like a little bit more than I'd give an average episode, just, you know, by their nature that they're inherently... They're different, yeah. Yeah, they're meant to be silly and goofy and more something that you, uh, you switch off your brain to enjoy. But I, I think even though I thought the last segment was really strong, I am ultimately going with a bronze for this one. And it's oh. just mostly because it's like a par for the course teens era Treehouse of Horror. Nothing like particularly... Well, there are a few things that are particularly wrong with it. But, you know, overall, uh, not a bad score. But anyway, that'll be a dull silver all round. And it'll be the second dull silver Treehouse of Horror joining Treehouse of Horror 17, which I think was the one where they have like a golem that comes to life and they make a female uh, yeah. golem for it. Oh, played by yeah. Fred Drescher. Fred Drescher, yeah. 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 The one we watched sounds way better than that one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, well, that about does it. And we're now going to the end of the classic era and reviewing season nine's Treehouse of Horror 8. We will be back. Eight, the scariest number. And we are back and we just watched our classic and final Treehouse of Horror for this evening. This was season nine, episode four. Don't believe what Disney Plus tells you. (laughs) Treehouse of Horror (laughs) V-I-I. I. (laughs) <laughs> First released in October of 1997, it was directed by Mark Kirkland, written by Mike Scully, David X. Cohen, and Ned Goldreyer. Uh, yeah, Omega Man, Fly vs. Fly, and Easy Bait Coven. What do we think of this one? Yeah, uh, classic stuff here. Th- there's there's some solid stuff. I actually think I liked the one we watched last a little bit more Agreed. than oh, this really? one. Like, I think this might be 
one of the less memorable early Simpsons treehouse this, ones. Whereas the one we watched before, I felt like was pretty steady all the way through at a pretty high, decent level. This one had some real high highs mm. and a surprisingly low low. Like, I felt like it was pretty deflated by the end of this one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot more meandering than I thought it'd be. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, Fly vs. Fly is the best segment we've watched today, so... Oh, I oh. <laughs> I mean, Fly vs. Fly is solid, and that does have yeah. the biggest laugh that, that we had, like, watching the entire time. All right, well, yeah, let's uh, get into the review. Uh, so, yeah, starting out, uh, it opens with this uh, Fox Sensor segment. Yeah, I do like he says, no, no, <laughs> no, no. I think we can do without the crack pipe. <laughs> that feels, feels, I was about to say it feels like they wouldn't pull that now, but they kind of would. I definitely, like, remember the whole, whole Mega Man as, like, a sketch that is sort of ingrained in my memory of, like, what I was talking for the previous of like something with like legitimate iconography, like Homer dancing mm. in the church. Yeah. And the moment that he steps out of the bomb shelter and yeah. gives Herman this can and is like, Oh, call that prime rib. <laughs> like I have a very, yeah. that, that memory is very, that image is very in my mind, but the, like as a sketch itself or as a segment, it's not all that funny. Like, I, I like the premise a lot of Homer being the last person. Mm -hmm. I don't, and I, I I think it's very funny that he's shopping for a bomb shelter. Yeah. when the actual <laughs> bomb goes off, and mm -hmm. a lot of very blatant French bashing, it, which yeah. which felt like a, a safe like ethnic slur that you could still use in the nineties. Mm -hmm. I I don't I don't like any of that bit, but I do like uh, Quimby doubling down and saying uh, uh, I stand by my ethnic slur, and then calling mm -hmm. them pretentious savages. Yeah, I, I, I think was... the part I don't like is when they cut over to the French and they're like, "We don't look yeah. like frogs," and then it's like, oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because before it was, yeah, more jokes on Mayor Quimby being a piece of shit. Yeah, because yeah. before it was, you know, this is the consequence of action, whereas now they're saying, but they were mm. right, they are frogs. Yeah. And I, I had forgotten that that whole segment was even in there. My memory was Homer steps inside the bomb shelter and then there's a light up outside mm. uh, and then he steps out and everyone is a skeleton. But it does, mm. there was a memory of comic book guy walking down the street yeah. that I'm like, oh yes, I remember this scene. Yeah, this this yeah. moment chills me to the bone because I feel like uh, <laughs> if, if the bombs are ever dropping, this is what I'm going to be thinking. You're going to be in the middle of your Brian K. Vaughn like saga <laughs> reread. <Yeah. laughs> and, <laughs> or just like playing some stupid video game and just like, oh shit, okay, well, here we go. Wasting yeah, I say the case yeah. for Tony Hawk ride right there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there it is. Yeah, yeah, that's, well, a, that's a definite oh, I wasted my life moment. You know, you <laughs> you know, the, the Simpsons Index podcast is, uh, the slogan is podcast till we die, so. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I really like from that as well that Herman sold the bomb shelter as in, it can withstand a six-ton mega blast, yep. no more, no less. Like, yeah. <laughs> I like the idea of the it's less than six megatons. Yeah, you're fine. This is um, also, yeah. I think, one of the later times that we have seen Herman. Like, it's weird how Herman was a sort of a major character in, like, mm. there's the episode Bart the General, which is, like, the third or fourth episode, where yeah, Herman yeah. is, like, the yeah. third most important character in it. <laughs> yeah. And, like, now he's just sort of totally out of the rotation, and this strikes me as one of the later episodes that he would show up in, certainly his military antiques. Pops up every now and then. Yeah, he's sort of there when they need to fill out, like, a uh, nutty right wing sort of like because they did an episode on preppers, so naturally he was in that one. Oh, oh sure. Him. Tom Waits, yeah. him and Tom Waits. Yeah, 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 that's right. Not too bad of an episode. Mm. And when Homer's in the theater, is that a reference to Tommy Boy? It's yeah, it was something like because there's yeah. a scene in Tommy Boy where they're pretending to be chased by bees, and I think that's what they're doing. Uh, right. And I, I did have to look it up, like that they were making Farley and Spade jokes. I'm like, when did Chris Farley die? He he died like two months after this episode aired. Oh really? Uh, yeah, so wow. he was he was still alive when they animated this. Um, yeah, but I, I also by this point, like in 1997, the Farley Spade movies had basically stopped i don't know if they were done permanently mm. but we'd had mm. tommy boy and then immediately they turned around black sheep and nobody liked that movie so they both kind of split <laughs> off and did their own things and then of course he, yeah. he passed away but yeah speaking of movies as well like apparently yeah this is based on the omega man yeah mm -hmm. once again this is yeah. my catchphrase for this episode i have not seen this movie i haven't seen it but i know omega man is the charlton heston movie that's based off i am legend that takes several liberties with the uh source material it is it's uh i think before the will smith i am legend came out this was kind of the cultural touch point for this 
short mm. story. Yeah, because they, they did a previous movie with Vincent Price called The Last Man on Earth back in the 50s based on the same story. Oh, right. And then the Omega Man was kind of a campier approach to it. Like in all the yeah. others, like it's just like zombies or, or vampires or animals, basically. And these ones, they're mutants. They look like they do in this episode. And they can talk and they have cars and they have things like do that. Do they have so. that weird like pink wacky races style of car that's the i don't remember yeah. specifically that does look like something from like rock and roll racing or something yeah. like that yeah, or like, yeah. Oh, yeah. That well yeah because for me this is the section of the segment which sort of gets into a bit of a slump for me like uh with the mutants the monsters chasing homer and it doesn't feel all that scary or i don't know it's not super funny yeah, either. i think it's just more meant to be fun but i do agree that it's surprising that when the action starts the segment actually slumps a little bit yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Think, oh, I think I'm going to say the same thing about the next segment we get to as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I do think there are a couple funny lines. I like the line a lot. Um, we don't like the term mutants. We prefer freaks. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. that's a line yeah. I think about a lot. Um, I think Homer punching the guy's skull until it explodes and yeah. him saying, still got it. Well, that's Kirk's skull. That's Kirk's yeah. skull. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Both, both when yeah. he was the Grim Reaper, we also see yeah. him kill Kirk. <laughs> Before that, he's got the line of her. Uh, maybe a little friendly punching will help. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a funny bit, I think. And I'm, then him dancing naked in the church is just great. Not to get bogged down yeah. on, like, plot holes for these kind of episodes, but, like, shouldn't the whole town just be, like, swimming with radiation? Yeah. Like, how, how is Homer able to just walk around and function? Like, it should just be a massive, like... Uh, dead zone i'm going to assume that he kind of built up a tolerance for it working at the nuclear plant okay that would make sense i like that or he's yeah, gonna he's... die in two days <laughs> yeah yeah that would be a decent explanation and explain why like burns and lenny are still around or whatever mm -hmm. yeah yeah and and it is a bit of a shrug to have the family all be fine and alive just because yeah. there's lead paint on the house you know yep i really remember that as being they actually used homer's bomb shelter and it worked i don't know why <laughs> yeah. oh, that gave us oh. a big laugh with his bomb shelter that said america number one on it oh yeah <laughs> which is the, good. Which is the cardboard good. box with the with umbrella. umbrella yeah <laughs> <laughs> absolutely but like on the radiation as well like after homer gets out of the bomb shelter like there is some beautiful coloring with the skies of mm -hmm. yeah post-apocalyptic yeah. springfield with like this is definitely green and blue gradients and purple clouds yeah an episode that I remember very strong visually, and I think because it sticks in my head visually, I think of it as one that I like more than I do. But then when I actually like it, I'm mm. like, yeah, okay, that was fine. I mean, there there are two moments, both in this segment and the next one, where the animators kind of went above and beyond. Like the zoom-in shot on uh, Comic Book Guy right before he dies is like mm. a pretty uh, yeah. intensive shot. And then very they do dynamic a, shot. They do a similar thing in the fly sequence when we're kind of like flying around from his perspective around Homer and Marge's heads. Mm. I'm like, yeah, the animators really went all out this episode. Yeah, absolutely. Any other notes about this segment? Does this one have the bit where they're at the dinner table and Homer is talking about a thing that Lenny said. <laughs> oh, that's the next one. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm just going to say, that is one of my favorite things that <laughs> always makes me laugh when you only hear the tail end of someone's joke or yeah. some yeah. anecdote that they're relating and then everyone laughs about it. I, I love that. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> that's a good line to add her. Well, Lenny said it. Yeah, Lenny said <laughs> yeah. it. There's a little joke about like the hippo de yes. um, police officer. And yeah. then you see in the newspaper clipping later, hippo promoted to detect. Yeah, that was a good bit. Do you got any more notes, BT? I do indeed. Uh, when he's thinking about his family all being dead, he's like, oh, little Bart, and he's got him like swinging and hitting <laughs> oh, the, the baseball, like a fond yeah. memory, and then little Lisa swing and hit, and then little Marge and swings and misses. I really like that. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Why, why do you think he Marge missed? Yeah. Like, is Marge not good at baseball the way Lisa yeah. is? <laughs> yeah. I, I guess that's a joke, but it's just a good bit. And the rest. <laughs> oh yeah, the, what, what's there? It's Maggie, the the pets on the TV. Yeah, it's, yeah, the things yeah. most precious to him. <laughs> yep, and uh, I just really like uh, a bunch of mutants clinging to the side of like a souped-up hog kind of vehicle. Yeah. that's just that's endless fun for me. Yeah. Um, my only other note is like unnecessarily Homer running down Johnny and Edgar Winter. Like, yeah, is it a... because? Oh yeah, they're albinos, so they. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's it's a joke because they're albino. They look like mutants. Are they albino yeah. in real life? Yeah, they are. Oh, yeah, they are. Yes. Okay. I didn't know who they were, so... John, uh, Edgar Winter Group, you know, Frankenstein. Frankenstein? Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> I mean, somewhere between all the killing and skin eating, you forget about the love. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's easy to go nuts with the skin eating. <laughs> all right. So if you're going to rank this segment, this segment alone, what would you give it? Woody. Uh, I'll give it a very low silver. Um, mm. as 
sort of unimpressed as I was with it this time, like it has stuck in my mind for a long time. And I always forget to judge things on like their visual merits because mm. I always think of the writing as sort of a focal point and I don't know that much about animation. But like I do think that this has a lot of very good visual moments. I think it's like an A in terms of visuals and a C in terms of writing. Yeah. Um, so mm. it puts it in sort of the silver in the middle there. What about you, Steve? Yeah, I think I think what he just convinced me on that. Yeah, I think I think it's in the in the in the silver range. There are some memorable bits in here, but like the completely unnecessary like French bashing can go, and it does have like a bit of a shrug of an ending. So, but it's uh, the the jokes are solid, and I'll always remember Homer like dancing naked in the church and punching a guy's <laughs> head to dust. Yeah, it's like those moments really stick in the brain strongly. Which like if I hadn't seen this in a while, I would have assumed it was a gold. But like, yeah, it's. It didn't really live up to that. So, yeah, silver for me. What do you reckon, BT? I'm going to silver as well. Um, look, it ticks a lot of my boxes. I like post-apocalypse. I like mutants. I like big, wacky cars with mutants on them. I'm having a good time. Well, speaking of ticking your boxes, this one apparently <laughs> ticked it very well. Whatever. Fly versus fly. You liked this one, BT? Oh, yeah. Come on. It starts with a nerdy reference when Lisa's, like, walking around Frink's yard sale and picks up, like, that MC Escher two-prong, three-prong visual trick. Yeah. Mm. And, like... I'm immediately like, ah, these people get me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I I know you guys do a good job. You guys rank things very precisely. Um, and I don't want to get into more precise ranking. That's not what you guys need. <laughs> but um, if you were to rank like individual moments and minutes of this show, I think the first two minutes of this are like solid mm. gold platinum cubic zirconia. Oh, yeah. And then once Bart actually like mixes mm. his DNA with the fly, it becomes noticeably less interesting. Yeah. Like, I don't think it ever is bad, but like, who boy, the, the standards of like Homer at the yard sale and when Homer first gets the matter transfer porter there's so many funny yeah. bits i i <laughs> wanted just an endless episode of homer doing shtick with the transporter yeah. because it's so funny and he's clearly having a ball yeah. like messing with it and it's clearly like he's going to way more effort to put this thing into the rooms than yeah. it would take just to <laughs> complete these easy not tasks. not the point elliot <laughs> yeah <laughs> and I just even his introduction to it of, hmm, two dollars hmm, only transports matter <laughs> yeah, like well, the implication, like what else is it going to transport? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, him yeah. negotiating it down, and then like to thirty-five cents. The first time walking through, and just like he's uh, got a little fire, and then we see the fire building on his back yeah. as he walks away, and he's oblivious <laughs> to it. It's great. <laughs> this uh, can bring on a catastrophic manager. I said, I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I love Frink. As we got a double Frink in this episode as well. Uh, I like uh, Frink's robot Lloyd as well, who like tries to sell himself, and it's like <laughs> you were made for scrubbing, and scrubbing is what you will do. Yeah, yeah, I, I actually uh, kind of agree with that take. I guess like what makes the fly stuff interesting for me is like this is when sort of the horror or Twilight Zoney mm. stuff in a treehouse is sort of meant to build. So, but I still thought there were some pretty good jokes. Like I did love Bart playing that prank on the spider. That, <laughs> Just slapping it in the face. That then shakes all four, like four of its, yeah. Yeah, it's a great bit. Yeah. I think this might be the scariest segment of um, all the ones we've at least watched today. Mm. Like I'm, uh, mm. giant spiders always kind of, Give me the ghiblies, but uh, mm -hmm. the You'd sort of hate it in Australia. <laughs> oh God! Yeah. Ooh, the, um, just like the we ride them to work, we do. <laughs> <laughs> um, just like the fly, sort of chasing Bart around. It, it, yeah, with those dynamic camera movements, it can be very scary. I, I wanted, I wanted to talk about a couple other little bits before Bart gets mixed up. I love it when Homer. Yeah, I, I love the cat ear medicine in the fridge, which is some reason the exact <laughs> shape, and it's in a pop top. I love yeah, that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And I love the mislead of Homer's noise of oh man, that's good. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, you know, um, it's a good choice of just like the grossest substance you can think of like yeah. the nastiest tasting yeah. thing you could think of would have to be cat ear medicine but homer likes it yeah and then yeah our, our, our all-time biggest laugh of the e of the evening the, so um was homer's this is a very sophisticated do wacky one one misuse <laughs> and kablamo and then he <laughs> punching <laughs> lisa in the face yeah. like just horrifying <laughs> but they don't show it yeah they don't yeah. show it but it's also implied that she's on the toilet She's clearly yes. on the toilet getting punched in the face by the invisible <laughs> fist of her dad. Like that and he was about to yeah, pee on her. I think this is the only time I He was about, about to pee yeah. all over. <laughs> oh god. Yeah, that's the only time I've thought about the implications of that. It's hang on. <laughs> 
Yeah, um, that 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 particular moment, and just I, again th- that sort of lead up of Homer buying the matter transporter and using it for all kind of stuff mm-hmm. is like top tier. I would put up that Simpsons those two minutes of Simpsons clip against anything in the show. Yeah, Bart, did you forget about our Kablamo talk? Yeah, I love yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of one of my favorite Homer riffs where he's like, stealing? Why do you think I bring you to church? For fun? Oh, I didn't hear anybody laughing. <laughs> yeah. What do you think of Captain What's-His-Name? Like, it's just this sort of meandering speech that Homer has no idea what he's talking about. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but even Bart's uh, getting into the contraption with uh, oh, two times the pet, none of the mess, and then the uh, two butts, and it's like, oh, you could be Lisa's. <laughs> two butt dog, yeah. And I just confirmed as well, this predated cat dogs. So oh, wow. There you go. Oh, That's where they go. got the idea from, yeah. Uh, and then predicted it. I do love Bart when he gets the fly and then looks at the transporter and is like, I'd be stupid not to do this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, That's a line Ma- I use a lot in my daily life. Yeah. And Marge is, what's all this mist? Yeah. <laughs> That's a good line for sure. See, the fly Bart is the thing that I really like about this episode. Mm. The characterization of this fly who is just all of a sudden in a human body trying to wave its arms around around yeah. and the family just rolling with it yep. like, as well it's like, uh, yep, it's your sugar he's banging like, the plate more syrup honey <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the vocalization is so good too yeah like, yeah and yeah it, it became a great villain and scary thing mm. for the episode when it starts going over after Lisa yeah because they didn't want to lean too much into the body horror I guess but you get that kind of out of your own mm. body horror that kind of existential horror I suppose I always yeah. felt like there was going to be one more joke in this episode, like when Bart comes out, because he doesn't talk when he comes out of the transporter. So I thought, like, mm. you know, there's going to be some twist where he's still making the blah, blah, blah noises, but mm. but everything, everybody's in the right body. But they go with the axe bit, which is a good bit, because Homer gets to <laughs> chase him with an axe and good. says, I promise I won't hurt you. <laughs> I'll chop you yeah. good. It's definitely a good I, one. I really like, you're only making it worse on yourself. <laughs> because like, yeah. Yeah. He's already trying to chop you with an axe. So. <laughs> there's, a good, there's a good variation on that bit in a later episode where Homer's chasing him with a mace, saying, I'll mace you good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Any other notes about Fly vs. Fly? Uh, I do like the Fly chasing Lisa around, and Marge's like, they're like this every rainy day. Yeah. <laughs> no one likes a tattletale. Yeah. <laughs> and Steve, if you were to rank Fly versus Fly and just Fly versus Fly, what would you give it? I think this is a silver for me. Yeah. Um, I think all the points you guys made are strong. Like the the beginning couple of minutes of this bit are are so so funny, and all the stuff with the transporter is solid gold. And then the fly stuff is a little less interesting, but uh, it's still a pretty funny episode overall. Yeah. What do you reckon, Woody? Uh, I'll give it a gold. Um, I think that the level of quality in this, the first bit, is just so high, and I have no problem with the rest of the episode. It just can't meet that level of quality. But yeah, if I give the Clock Stoppers episode a gold, I'll happily give this one a gold. Yeah. Yeah, same here. Uh, this fits in with maybe not my all-time Treehouse of Horrors, mm. but definitely in the upper portion PT. Uh, yeah, I'm going to just straight gold. I had a lot of fun with this. I quite like it. All right. So that moves us on to the Crucible. I mean, Easy Bake Coven. <laughs> <laughs> Marge is a witch. What do we think? We think that the Crucible and the Scarlet Letter always get confused because they're the two things that you were forced to read in high school and thus just like blended them together in your mind. Yeah, these this <laughs> era, yeah. This is far and away the weakest part of this episode. Mm, yeah. uh, I've seen this episode many, many times, like always in syndication, and it's just like... This one comes on, I'm just like, oh man, it's this one again? Yeah, because it's it's just, it's fine. It's just, there's no real mm. joke here. I like that the others were pretty focused parodies of specific movies, like Omega Man and yeah. The Fly, and then this one is just sort of, uh, just witches, you know? And In they're general, using the very yeah. generic kind of like Halloween store design for a witch with the cauldrons mm. and all that. They're just not really doing much fun with it. I definitely like, much like the whole Mega Man, like have a lot of memories of this episode. I think that it was, this was slightly before like every third episode was like a sort of different version of the Simpsons in like medieval time or mm-hmm. like what yeah. if the Simpsons mm. were Chinese? I, I don't know. Like yeah. just some sort of... <laughs> different costuming of the Simpsons as like a premise or like Simpsons Bible stories or Simpsons tall tales. So this one felt more memorable when I first seen it. Yeah. But like, it's not very funny. Like it's not in the jokes that they have. This very like, cutesy in this almost feels like on the level of like Char- it's the great pumpkin charlie brown in terms yeah. of like the toothlessness of the jokes except mm. for one joke later which always surprises me and i always where they get the candy from Maud and ned 
and you think that that's uh, from the f- Goody and Ned. Ned yes, <laughs> yeah. You think that's the first house they visited yeah. because, like, of course, yeah. the show isn't going to have Marge eat a kid, right? And then later she's <laughs> like, "Oh, we shouldn't have filled up on all those kids first. <laughs> like, that's the only time yeah. where I'm like, "Oh yeah, that's that's a very Simpson-y joke." Yeah, slightly edgier. I mean, even the magic stuff that they do is more like wacky schmacky. It's they turn Wiggum into a gopher, and like Lou mm. is just in a fairy costume. You know, he can just <laughs> yeah. Take and then, like, off, he becomes he a snowman and Lou's in just a fairy costume. Uh, I like it as the joke of escalation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it doesn't feel well, very de- de-escalation. like cohesive. As it's just kind of three things that they can turn you into. Yeah, I just I just have fun with this one overall. But yeah, it's not very not very deep and not very not a lot, but it's at least fun. I think sort of some of the jokes were just sort of more playing with the setting. Like mm. for some reason, all the women are named Goody. I don't know if this was a reference to anything. Yeah, or... no, that's yeah, uh, I can't that, exactly that's, what it is. That's a real thing. In in this era, like the Puritans would refer to themselves as like Goodman or Good Wife, right? Uh, which I only know because of a short story they forced us to read in, in high school called Young Goodman Brown, uh, and and that's where yeah. I, I got all that from. But so that that makes the joke of Goody it's, Bad uh, Wife kind of funny. <laughs> it's where the expression Goody Two Shoes comes from. Um, oh, is that yeah. right? Yeah, because um, Puritans always had two shoes. Interesting. Uh, it's weird, but. Um, <laughs> It was yeah, it was fun. A, I liked uh, I liked horny Ned in this episode where yeah, yeah. Ma, Maud <laughs> says that they'll make us commit wanton acts of carnality and says that'll be the day. I thought that was a lot of fun. I like that. I yeah. like the the few the few times that they let Ned be sexually frustrated. It's always funny. Mm. Yeah. But yeah, they're sort of more playing with the language of this style as well. With Bart is like must drop pantaloons. My first note. Um, <laughs> but I really, really, I know it sticks with me with Patty and Selma, which is being like, "Hmm, needs more eye of Newt." Ah, if it was up to you, ah, uh, you always want more yeah, eye of Newt. It'd be nothing but Newt eyes. Like, right. I, th- I think there's some fun things, but like, again, they're not particularly memorable. Yeah, like, they're just fun little words to say, like caramel card. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And it just ends with yeah. like, a, and that's how Halloween was created kind of tag, you oh, know, which, which just I did like the sea captain saying this yearly custom became an annual tradition. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, good Foley work on the caramel cod, because whoever, mm. whoever was recording that really needed to come up with, they needed to make it sound different than the caramel apple. Mm. It mm. needs to sound like yeah. juicier, but softer at the same <laughs> time. And they did it. I don't know what they did, but it sounds well, like someone needed caram- to a real cod. Hey. I hope so. I hope so. I hope Take a bunch of cats together. <laughs> <laughs> or that. Uh, any other notes on Easy Bake Coven? No, it's just kind of like, it's it's a pretty unmemorable early Treehouse episode, but it, I think. Like, it is memorable mm. in the sense that, like, it felt like this was... As a kid, I remember really liking this because I thought it was so fun that they yeah. were like, oh, these are the Sims in the past, but now mm. that doesn't have the same appeal yeah. because they've done it so much. Yeah. And you just kind of want to lean into the jokes and just the jokes here are not good. No. Yep. Mm. Uh, this witch hunt is turning into a circus is a line I like. The, uh, the term the term witch hunt is not is not fun anymore. Yeah. The term witch yeah, hunt true, used to be true. fun, yeah. but it got co-opted. Yeah. Uh, yep. There's a lot of things that used to be fun and <laughs> <got> co-opted. <laughs> Red hats, for example. Um, yeah. yeah. I do like how <laughs> yeah. Marge's hair explodes into bats. That's good. Oh, yeah. That was a nice touch, a nice way to use the character model to do something spooky. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I do like their plan was to just swipe their shoes, but a good idea is a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I did think the uh, the Rod and Todd bit of like, you did everything you could after he brandished a cross at them once. I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd yeah. like the sound when they dropped the kids in the sack as well. Just, ow. Yeah. <laughs> BT, if you were to rank Easy Bake Coven and Easy Bake Coven alone, what would you give it? I give it a bronze. It's cute, and I feel like it doesn't have the time to be a full segment because I feel like the other ones ran a little long, and it's like, ah, uh, we need to put something fun together, just whatever. Yeah, in that sense, I think it's a shame that it's the last one. Mm. Like, I wish for pacing it would have been the middle, but like the ending Ended on a high worked. note. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what do you reckon, Steve? Uh, yeah, I think a low bronze for me, too. It's a pretty harmless bit overall. Just, just kind of, yeah. I think, yeah, what he said, toothless. I think that's about right. And Woody, uh, I'm going to give it a participant. Mm. Like I didn't. Oh wow. Uh, I, yeah, it was pretty lame, and I think that that's just been oh because at this point I've seen the episode where it's a fully fledged episode with the Simpsons in medieval times, right? And that mm. sort of strikes mm. a lot of similar notes and is just better. I don't know, like for as edgy as sort of the fly one felt, this one just feels like it's for a whole different audience. Yeah, like this this feels like an episode designed to like my guess. Who did you say the writers were for this episode? Because my guess is that the person whose name I didn't recognize wrote this segment and was a freelance yeah. a freelance writer. Because it doesn't really feel like it hits the uh, tone of the show. 
Yeah, that's right. That was Ned Goldreyer that wrote the final segment, and David X. Cohen mm. wrote Fly vs. Fly, and Mike yes. Scully wrote Omega Man, which just, this makes a lot of sense now. <laughs> yeah, because it, it does really strike me as this episode is written by someone who is familiar with the characters of The Simpsons, but not really going for the particular tone. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, it's time to rank this thing. And Steve, we'll start with you this time. What would you like to give Treehouse of Horror 8? You know, I'm gonna. I'm. I'm kind of surprised at how, I don't know. Generally, not it, it, this. This was not one of the stronger early Treehouse of Horrors, but that still puts it in pretty good company. So I think it's a low silver for me. I think the yep. the funny stuff in uh, Fly versus Fly and Home Mega Man makes up for kind of the more meandering stuff. Not the most memorable, but like, yeah, there's there's some good stuff in here. Woody, what do you reckon? Right there with Steve. Low silver. Fly versus Fly is is great. It would be a lot of fun. I mean, not that not that there was really any need for a clip show anymore, but just something that was like, hey, here's a show, an hour long Simpsons episode that's just like the 10 best, you know, Treehouse mm. of Horror epi- segments. And yeah. this, this, I think Fly vs. Fly might, would make it in there. BT, finish? Oh, wait, no, I haven't said mine yet. Mm. Uh, I'm going a silver as well. And it's a sort of surprising silver. I, yeah, like I said, if it was up to my memory, I probably would have given it a gold or thought it was a little bit better. But yeah, there's just a bit of flatness in this uh, one, but still, yeah, an overall good time. BT. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to silver. I mean, our rankings were silver, gold, bronze. That evens out. Silver, silver, silver. So yeah, that'll be a unanimous silver. And it will be the third Treehouse of Horror to get a unanimous silver. It'll be joining Treehouse of Horror 7, mm-hmm. which I think will surprise some people because Citizen Kang is so awesome, but the other oh, yeah. two segments, not that great. And also Treehouse of Horror 15 from season 16, which... Um, actually does have a crack pipe in it, I think. Okay, fun. Oh, cool. Well, all right. I don't remember that at all, damn. <laughs> no, it's a pretty solid one. All right, guys. Well, not only was that the last Treehouse of Horror from the classic era, but I forgot to mention before, that was the last Treehouse of Horror from the teens era, which means <gasps> the Simpsons Index Wait. have reviewed the first 30 Treehouse of Horrors now. Holy shit. Whoa. Holy shit. Nicely done. Oh. <laughs> Nicely done. Yeah. Yeah, so um, only 30 more to go, apparently, because Disney <laughs> keep renewing The Simpsons. Sure. <laughs> um, but also, I forgot Till to mention before... Till we die, Elliot. <laughs> well, I forgot to mention before as well, that was our last season 15 episode, so... Oh, oh wow. Now we've completed our reviews for season 1 and season 15. Yay! Yay. Yay. The two yeah. best seasons. <laughs> yeah, 1 in 15. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they say. Definitely. Um, Woody, Steve, thank you so much for joining us for our ninth Treehouse of horror Yeah. Well, thank, thank you so you. much for having us. And, uh, yeah, if people want to hear more of you guys online, where can they do that? Uh, yeah, we, we host the show We Universe, uh, and uh, Ultra 64 was our we, older show. We it's, still it's host kind of, Ultra 64. Yeah, it's, it's kind of... It's in the past. It's in a, yeah, exactly. But exactly. if you're interested in every Nintendo 64 game, you can find, hear us talking about that on Ultra 64. That's all complete. It's all ranked. If you're interested in every Wii U game, you can hear about us talk about that now. And if you're interested in hearing us do deep dives into different specific series, uh, we've got our Patreon-exclusive show, uh, Ultra 64 DD. Currently, we are making our way through the Tony Hawk series. We're about to start a new one-off series to do a deep dive into. And basically, we're just playing every game in a given franchise and talking about them wow. contextually. And check out, a lot of check out the it. Metroid one. I feel like the Metroid one is the right, yeah. the, the right balance. It's, so that's a good way to good, start. Good games that we played. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But yeah. we also covered James Bond and Contra. And yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, I personally had a lot of love for the Tony Hawk series. But yeah, I agree. The Metroid one was a lot of fun as well. And, like, on the change from N64 to where you... Like, I remember when you guys ran out of N64 games and you announced on the podcast you were going to do the Wii U catalogue. I literally dropped the dishes that I was washing and did a little dance in a circle because (laughs) as someone who, yeah, grew up with N64 as a kid Mm -hmm. and then was a massive Wii U apologist (laughs) (laughs) for many years, yeah, it's been, yeah, an absolutely great series. Um, Oh, thank you. It's it's been fun to dig into. There's lots of stuff I'm not familiar with, so it's it's cool to dig into. stuff no one's familiar with <laughs> yes <Exactly>. very true <laughs> but uh bt what about if people want to hear more of us all right well they could start perhaps by going to our game of thrones podcast thrones of game where we reviewed the entire series backwards which wrapped recently we actually We're did it done so you can listen to our podcast backwards which would be game of thrones <laughs> forwards as we learn less and less about the show if you really want to be confusing <laughs> as fuck for some reason i don't know <laughs> Our other one, if you want something more structured, we have a fiction uh, 
radio drama serial, Pulp Fury Radio. This is where I've written a bunch of scripts from various genres. We've got an actors to come in, do some Foley work and all that kind of stuff. I'm not, I've, I've never figured out the succinct way to pitch it. Uh, you've probably heard us <laughs> yell about it before on The Simpsons Index, but to you new listeners, if you're looking for something that's a, a structured story, uh, each episode is a different genre, a completely new story, and it was a lot of fun to make. So check that out. And yeah, also our Patreon, patreon.com slash Studios. We're making another Simpsons podcast except mm-hmm. when he's not where BT's reviewing the episodes that he wasn't there for when we reviewed him on the six on the Simpsons index and we've also <laughs> released a couple of experimental podcasts mm. one of which being storyboard the chalkboard where we try and make Simpsons episodes based on the chalkboard gags that uh, appear at the start of the episode so yeah, yeah that was a lot of fun there's also an episode where we try to write spec scripts for Halloween yeah oh that's right did that work out oh nice uh, yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, I probably went too far on mine. You but, did. Uh, <laughs> check that out on patreon.com slash sidequest studios. How far did Elliot go? Find out. <laughs> sidequest studios, Patreon. All right, guys. Uh, yeah, that about wraps it up. Thank you very much, Steve. Absolutely. And thank you very much, Woody. Yeah, I, I, I'm back. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, BT. I'll chop you good. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been your host, Elliot J. O'Neill. That's all the mustard in the haunted house. Woo! Thank you for listening to the Simpsons Index podcast, which is also an online spreadsheet available at thesimpsonsindex.com. You can chat to us online at facebook.com slash thesimpsonsindex or at simpsonsindex on Twitter and Instagram. And now please stay tuned for the bonus scenes. All right, here comes the first number. One, two, three, four, five, six. Wonderful. Two, four, four. Oh, Three to firm. I was thinking it, don't worry. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not, I'm not the only one. You weren't alone on that one. <laughs> and Woody. Yeah, I'm in pretty much the exact same spot as... Uh-oh. Sorry. Uh, you yeah, may have you just guys crashed. have paused. Oh, God, they're frozen in time. No, who, yeah. who touched the clock? <laughs> t- were we holding the clock at the same time somehow? I, we're in oh, different no. houses. It must be the entire country. Oh, God, we've uh-huh. lost America. Oh dear. Yeah, yeah. They're really not coming back, are they? I don't know. I don't think he's coming back. Although, of all segments to freeze on. I know. <laughs> all right, that'll be back soon. Well, now it's time for some bonus content. Yeah. <laughs> uh, bonus content. Why can we give the little SOBs? Say, Elliot, what are you doing today in lockdown? <laughs> not much, buddy. Aha! Yeah, yep, 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 yep. Yeah, we're we're rolling on our end. All right, it's rolling on my end. Oh, BT, yeah. how's your end? Uh, rolling like Limp Bizkit. Yuck. <laughs> Any of you guys see that recent photo of Fred Durst, by the way, where he looks like everyone's dad? Really no. <laughs> Have you I seen randomly... that video? Sorry. Sorry? I was going to say, I've seen that video of him playing the worst guitar solo ever. Oh, God. <laughs> It's I've, so I've just been I've been randomly rewatching the show House. I don't know if you guys got that. You know, straight yeah, yeah. You, yeah, okay. And yeah, uh, yeah, he shows up in one episode just playing a bartender with like one line. And I'm like, oh, huh. weird. Did you ever go watch that movie that Fred Durst directed with John Travolta? Yeah. No, yeah. I heard. I made Beach watch. I heard that's uh, pretty how, terrible. How was it? Recommended? Elliot? It's not. It's bad, but it's not bad in the way you would think it would be. It's more. It doesn't know what to do, I guess. Mm. So it's not very fun. No, not fun, bad. Um, and John Travolta's performance is weird, offensive, and inconsistent, and weird. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, you kind of walk away going, "Wait, was I supposed to sympathize with the the super fan, or sympathize with the guy he's stalking, or because everyone's kind of terrible?" And it's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I just don't know. Yeah, you walk away with just no idea what that was. Yeah. Anyway, so a curiosity it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, uh, ready to sync up then? Everyone's recording? Yeah, let's do it. Mm-hmm. All right, cool. Here comes the first number. One, two, three, four, five. V-I-I. Damn it, just V-I. <laughs> Damn it! That's seven. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the number of counting shall be six. <laughs> Sinking game, Roman edition. <laughs> <laughs>